Today, we're going to talk about Jada Pinkett, and this is the second interview we've analyzed on her. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? So we're going to watch excerpts from two videos. One is an interview where she went to correct something from her first interview with Hoda from today. And then we will have a Jay Shetty interview with her, which is a very different style video. And I think it's telling. If you find another great love or if Will finds <clears throat> another great love. There's no finding another great love. And I think that's the point. It's like we are in a place now that we are in a deep healing space. And we are really concentrating on healing the relationship between us. So it may not be the divorce on paper anymore? There's no divorce on paper. I mean, not on paper. There might not be a divorce in theory anymore? Yeah, no. We really have been working hard. Oh. See? Okay. Well, I didn't know that. That's what I, the whole day I was trying to take. Well, I, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I totally missed that on the whole day. That's wait. the whole so wait, so wait, just so I'm 100% clear, you were divorced, not on right. paper, but now we might be a point where we're back together. We are working very hard at bringing our relationship, yes, bringing our relationship together. Back, back to a marriage again. Back to a life partnership. Ship. Yes, because okay. here's the thing about me. husband, wife, marriage for me, yeah, for yeah, my healing yeah. process. I came into that with very specific ideas, right? Very specific ideas that were blocks to me just seeing yeah. Will as who he is. Yeah. He can't be this perfect, idealized yeah. husband. Yes. Yes, of course I not. have to be able to accept him for the human that he is. He yes, accepts me for the human that I am, and we want to love each other there. Okay, so you might like live in the same house and have the same. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hold it. that's it's the another only part. That's the only well, part in the special well, that I felt like got okay. lost. Well, guess oh, what? Oh, yeah. It is found. We found <laughs> it today. We found it today. Jada, thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you. your time. All right, Chase, what do you got? I want to know what y'all think. But uh, if Stanley Kubrick was still alive, this looks like a scene from some dystopian candy shop where the employees are in there with this colors and the white turtleneck and the white couch. It looks like Stanley Kubrick to me. I'll uh, let y'all figure that out or answer that. One thing you're seeing a lot of is this. And this is commonly referred to as a stop gesture. The fingers are all the way extended. And in your history, if you've ever tried to talk someone out of doing something or try to get someone to stop doing something, your fingers extend. Even if your hand is in your pocket, down at your side, in your purse, doesn't matter. We naturally kind of do this to stop somebody from doing something. When she says relationship between us, there's a strong chin boss movement right there. And she says he can't be for perfect and there's no mention of her being imperfect she doesn't mention her imperfection at all just her being a human being and right at the moment that she says live in that uh, hoda says you can live in the same house there is pure disgust and if you just think of the facial expression of disgust everything kind of squeezes in toward the middle a little bit you imagine like smelling a rotten jug of milk and then her eyes close all the way when she says, yeah, about living in the same house. That had some huge red flags for me. Y'all probably picked up on even more. Scott, what'd you see? All right. Yeah. Well, I won't repeat that part of it. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's I think we saw a lot in here. And the thing is, this originally was the last video we were going to show. Then Greg called and said, hey, listen, we should put that one at the beginning and do the first video because she contradicts a few things in that thing. In this first video, we can go through and, and watch that. So here we're seeing this pretty pretty much the same gestures, the same illustrators. We're seeing the same body language we're seeing in, in the in the following videos in a different interview that we're seeing here, except for they're not as animated. There are some spots in the other ones where they're where she's more animated. But in this one, I agree with you, Chase. It seems so fake. I mean, it is because it's TV. Nobody has a couch like that at home. No, you wouldn't talk that way at home. I don't anyway. I know you guys don't talk that way. So the whole thing seems a little bit odd, but she seems, she falls back into it. Watch from now on in the other videos as she falls into this thing where she starts, like you were saying, using her hand, 
but she starts this teaching mode thing where she starts telling you about what's happening and what she's learned and all these wonderful things that have happened and how she's in control of it. Everything looks as it should if you're in that world, if you're in the TV world and you're on TV and you're an actress and you're or an actor, I don't know what they call them these days, and you're an actor and you're trying to be this person you've shown everyone you are and trying to stay in that that character. I think everything looks the way it should, um, especially since she's following that protocol she always follows of trying to be in charge of what's happening and telling you what's happening and teaching you something as you go along. Greg, what do you got? Yeah. She almost gollumed up the wrong answer there. I love that. When she asked her, can you live together? Yeah. That's the oddest answer of all of the things she does, but let's leave it at that and go backward and look at everything else. Mark, you and I talked last week about glass painting is what I call it. And we were saying, maybe we come up with a collective name for it. But she glass paints. And by that, I mean, she is there to deliver a package of goods that is packaged for consumption by that person. That takes a hell of a lot of practice to be good at, which is a bad sign that somebody's being that casual and that selective with the way they deliver information. Chase, you have a security clearance or you did when you're active military. It's like the first time you walk up and you're talking to somebody about something you know and you can't talk about the topic in detail because you know something that they might learn. And they're fishing and poking. They don't know that you know this thing, but you do. And so you're so careful with it. You do your best to avoid it at every turn, and you hold them off at a distance. That's what she's doing here with the way she uses her words. I love the body language in this one because there's a whole lot of mechanical stuff going on here. She, When Hoda asked the question, this first question, Look at her lower teeth get exposed. That's anger. Arrows and her eyes are narrowed. And then it's followed by some asymmetry in the left side of her face or contempt as she starts to describe what this is, what this is. This is not what that is. Her tone says everything to me. Listen to that shift in tone. It's not an angry tone, it's a patronizing tone. It's very strong, in my opinion. And then you look at those elongated key points as she elongates the vowels in the words she's trying to drive. And I was wondering, Chase, I was thinking is because she does some false cognates in other places. I've never seen anybody capable of controlling their chin. So I don't think it is, but it's in an odd kind of abandoned place. And that left eye, that data intake eye in her is narrow as it can be in this situation. We're going to see a very different situation when she's sitting with somebody talking about something she wants. And when she says, yes, her head bobbles. I got a 1958 Impala. I think a, a jaded doll would look really good on top of the dash. Just doing that looked like something from the 1950s. None of it looks real. None of it looks believable. And it looks like she came to your point packaged as some person to fit into the situation and to give the details. Very different from what we saw last week and all this bubbly over the top about this relationship and avoiding outright the question about whether they're going to move in together or not. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I would call this Jada splaining going on to Hoda. Uh, it, it is very forceful. It is quite condescending, uh, I think. Also, it kind of switches codes. You've got this first splaining part where she's very, very forceful and direct. And then she tries to, I think, ameliorate that a little bit with something more kind of colloquial to the two of them, something more banterish. The pitch starts, you know, going right up there. And I think she's trying to, you know, level out how explaining she's doing. But but as an explainer, she's to my understanding, she's come on to redress something that wasn't fully understood the first time around. I'm no clearer as to what on earth is going on here. It's not a good explainer. The, the cynic uh, inside of me would suggest it's like one of those emails you get from a company that's marketing when it says in the title, uh, you know, we messed up. We got something wrong. But all they're trying to do is get another eye shot at you to send you through their link. It feels the same to me that the, the cynic inside me would go, you correcting a mistake that you don't think was a mistake because you're getting another shot at pitching your book. Listen, no problem. I, I you know, I don't mind people who who send me those emails to go, we messed up. I, I kind of know what you're doing. And so I kind of feel like I know what's happening here, which is which is a little bit disappointing. Um, yeah, I've no doubt they're not going to live in the same house. You know, there's that inflection there. There's the disgust that we see there. There's even a, a bit of a peach snort beforehand as well to to see Hoda out of that territory. Um, 
she she spins. It's very political what's happening there. She tries to reframe a lot of the ideas that are going on. It, and, and we see the start of something we're going to see throughout the next lot of videos, which is I think she finds it very hard to explain her feelings in very literal form of who will do what and where and what things actually tangibly are and look and feel like. And she goes for concepts that we're not allowed to touch and we're not allowed to question those concepts. She does it here uh, and we'll see that going on. Interesting start of oh, that and chase with the you're right with the, all that white white against white it really is the <laughs> the, the the savior uh, look Will, Will Smith did did the same in one of his videos by literally having a, a white light behind him in a halo it was it was uh, interestingly uh, done so the savior has shown up and I think that's something of her her idea that she is a, a spiritual master of some sort and 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 I think that's the icon she's now looking to to push which is tricky because she she maybe doesn't have some of the self knowledge that you would probably think somebody should have in order to fit that category one of those tape replays if you find another great love or if will finds <clears throat> another great love there's no finding another great love and I think that's the point it's but like we are in a place now that we are in a deep healing space and we are really concentrating on healing the relationship between us. So it may not be the divorce on paper anymore? There's no divorce on paper. I mean, not on paper. There might not be a divorce in theory anymore. Yeah, no, we really have been working hard. Oh, See? okay. Well, I didn't know that. that we the might hold I was trying to take it. Well, I, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I totally missed that on the whole. That's wait. the whole. So wait, so wait, just so I'm 100% clear, you were divorced, not on right. paper, but now we might be a point where we're back together. We are working very hard at bringing our relationship, yes, bringing our relationship together. Back, back to a marriage again. Back to a life partnership. Yes, because okay. here's the thing about Tell me. husband, wife, marriage, for me, yeah, for yeah, my healing yeah. process. I came into that with very specific ideas, right? Very specific ideas that were blocks to me just seeing yeah. Will as who he is. Yeah. He can't be this perfect, idealized yeah. husband. Yes. Yes, of course I not. have to be able to accept him for the human that he is. He yes, accepts me you. for the human that I am, and we want to love each other there. Okay, so you might like live in the same house and have the same. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hold it. that's it's the another only part. That's the only well, part in the special well, that I felt like got okay. lost. Well, guess oh, what? Oh, yeah. It is found. We found <laughs> it today. We found it today. Jada, thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you. your I wanted you to walk us through like what were the stages and how would you define the stages as you do in this book? Your stages of your relationship with Will. Mm. Because I feel that that's the part that people get blurry because they're looking at it through their lens. Yeah. But you both have been so clear yeah. about stages of your relationship internally, which I actually think is the hardest part. And so right. how would you define the stages of your partnership with Will that help people understand like the conversations that you're having behind the scenes from like being madly in love to, you know. Yeah. Whew. The stages of getting to the most authentic and this difficult. So I just want to honor that for a second. Like, it's almost like talking about relationships and the romanticism around the idea of relating is sometimes as detrimental as talking about politics and God, mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's such, a, it's such a staple in how people look at marriage and relating culturally, mm. right? And all of the romanticism around it. And Will and I have been what I would consider kind of the relationship goals, mm -hmm. this romanticized version. Mm -hmm. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I love this interview for one reason, not because I love it, but because I like knowing who I'm dealing with and meaning all facets of a person. She does a lot of embedded confession in that last video we watched where she says she can change to fit the situation. That's being chameleon-like, which is okay. 
but not if it's to get what you want. That There's a certain personality type that has that, or there's several personality types. But her baseline here is dramatically different than the one we just watched and very different from the NBC interview. This is why I always say to you guys, you can't look at baseline in person at home, eating Cheetos on the couch. You got to look at the baseline for where they start and look for deviations in that situation. This is a great opportunity. Mark, I was going to wait till the end. I know you got to have something to say about a wardrobe choice considering the situation and what we're talking <laughs> okay. about. I mean, uh, if she if she's not oh, if yeah. she's not trying to look like a, a Hari Krishna, I don't know what she's doing. All the loose clothing and all that. I, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's a wardrobe decision. Maybe I'm projecting onto her. But it sure sure looks like it's a, a, an intentional wardrobe decision. Um, I'll leave that one alone just because I think it's a hot one. But this guy is a this guy. Um, Jay Shetty does a textbook image of what we call internal voice. If you see him looking down to his left as he works through a question, that is exactly what we mean by internal voice or internal conversation or discourse. He's thinking. He's using words and and bringing them up as he thinks through the process. And it's a great great illustration of it. She came here to pontificate. And I think that's part of this whole interchange that they do. And you can see that that's part of their whole game because she's doing this right, right. That she would do in other places when she's pontificating. Then there's that edit. And they will, you guys are going to talk about the edit, I'm sure. Yeah. But how do we go from that topic to another topic entirely in there? What my immediate brain wants to say is why did that happen? And who chose to take out whatever that was? Don't know what it was had to be something of significance so they wouldn't have cut it that poorly. Uh, I'll just leave it at that and say, uh, Scott, what do you got? I agree with you about the edits. I had a big thing about that because on some of these, she's got a, one expression is just blaring out and you go the next one, it's completely changed. And you can see where they, they piece these things together. One time in one of these, her arms are crossed and the other one, you come back and they're not crossed. It's, it's just, but I don't, there may be a reason for that. I don't know. Um, like you were saying, I don't know what the reason would be or who decided to make that decision, but maybe she may be like me in some cases where she talks and then waits a few seconds and it starts jumbling up and they just cut that out and then to make it shorter and tighter and a better conversation. I don't see her running over her words like I do because here we see where her head goes down and she starts um, gripping those her ankle, just above her ankle with, with both hands, and then starts talking from this quarter inch depth of, of newfound knowledge she's she's got from all these therapy books apparently she's been reading. And these are then these are just platitudes that she that she's talking that that she's spewing out. That's all it is. It's just things she's heard before. She's she's just giving you things from these books. I know somebody like that that does that. And she does the exact same thing. That's why I was like, oh my gosh, I recognize this. I think there's a bunch of people that that might do that. And it's probably because they're excited and they want to tell you about what they've learned. But it always seems to go inward and from this narcissistic perspective. That's the person that I know that does this. That's that's the way uh, they handle it. So it's, it's kind of unnerving when you, get in, when you start getting deeper with it. Then And I just did this, but She's, Jade is doing this a lot. That's really odd to be talking, throwing your illustrators out and going, we talk, we did this without saying we talked about something. We did this. And she's making this little sock puppet gesture with her hand, which was odd to me. We've seen it before in the last uh, episode we did. She was doing that a couple of times. But here uh, she does it. it. It seems out of place when she's doing this. Notice the words she uses as well. She uses words. And we'll hear these over and over. Honor, healing course, me, my, myself, I, those words, transparency, journey, path, trauma response, acceptance, and share. We hear all those things. And there's nothing wrong with those words individually in and of themselves, by themselves. But when they keep coming together in groups and you keep hearing the same thing over and over, that's how we know she's, she's you know, eyeball deep in these therapy books, because that's the way those things uh, present themselves once you once you've you've ingested all that information you start puking it up and telling everybody you know it like when we read books on uh behavior and body language we I, we get in here I, I get so excited i can't hardly stand it i can't i can't slow down and get it out quick enough but she's been thinking about this long enough where she wants to, to be the teacher here or the the guru in this situation and teach you these things as she's going along if if she didn't take the narcissistic approach to it, where it's all I, me, to me, I think, it would, I think it would it would be accepted a little easier on my part anyway than the way she's handling it. And then um, 
I think her, her illustrators, I think she's being honest about this. I don't see any deception cues in this thing because her, her, her illustrators are right on point land where they should. She seems to, you know, when she uses her, her illustrators are up high, they're good. They're solid. She's talking at a great volume. She's got it and it's even, it's steady. Her cadence seems to be just rolling right along. It seems fine. So I think she's speaking from the heart. And when she does, she does this too. And she touches her, her chest and her heart. So I, as well, I think this is an, is an example of the more someone talks, the less they know. And we're seeing that here. The more she talks about this, the more you start realizing she doesn't know a whole lot. The depth of it's very, very shallow because she doesn't, she's learning about it. I don't think, I don't think she knows as much as she'd like to, but I think she knows more than is comfortable for us to listen to, if that makes any sense. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So I totally agree with you, Greg. Um, she's shown up in a monastic like clothing. Uh, yeah, we could both of us be projecting on that, knowing that the interviewer is an ex Hare Krishna uh, monk. Um, but, you know, possibly not. The environment is not hers. The environment is his. But she gets to choose her clothing. And it is interesting what she's gone for there, given that circumstance. Uh, and also the circumstance of, of, like you say, Scott, the idea that she's trying to get across now of being um, spiritually you know, awoken and and um, wanting to tell people uh, about that. Okay, so uh, uh, Jay, who's interviewing her, puts forward uh, and it gives her an offer there of a metaphor that she picks up on and goes with, which is people get blurry. Other people's lenses are blurry when they look at her situation um so external people looking at this are blurred and romanticized they they both uh both the interviewer and the subject uh, agree and put forward this idea where whereas internally will and jada are clear and authentic so their lens is clear they're authentic our lens as an outsider we're blurred and romanticizing this thing. Well, no, but our lens doesn't have that opportunity. All our lens can deal with is what you project to us. We don't, we don't really have a lens to look at it. You, you, you're in control very much of the image that's being put forward. And we, the public, got a, a very different idea uh, than you're now saying is the internal thing. Why? Because your machine and you communicated very clearly to the public what you wanted us to believe. And we believed it because what else had we got? We hadn't got anything else uh, to go on. She then puts forward this idea that this, this um, talking about this relationship is like politics and God and culture. So she's basically gone you get off this territory. You do not question this. If you question how I'm seeing this, it's, it's political, it's 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 religious, and it's cultural. She gave us the three top things, which in certainly in in America will get you into an argument with somebody: politics, religion, and culture. I, I think we just got seen off the territory here. Though I'm I'm still in. I'm English. I'm still in. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm I'm a bit obtuse, uh, you know, uh, and and uh, not well uh, not well brought up. So I'll just dive straight in there. Though she has tried to see all of us off on commenting on any of this in an in a in a um, a detailed way because we'd get ourselves into trouble if we do that. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think it's it's funny here how Jay says they both have been so clear about their relationship. He says this in the video about her lying about the relationship. <laughs> and she's, she says the stages to getting the most authentic and it's difficult. That's a sentence that was used. The stages to getting the most authentic and it's difficult. Whatever that means. Then she says, I want you to count the number of distancing phrases that you hear in this sentence. It's almost like talking about relationships and the romanticism around 
the idea of relating is sometimes. <laughs> That's in yeah. one sentence. This might be the most avoidant, empty, and distancing sentence that we have ever analyzed here on the show. Uh, 300 plus episodes, maybe 200 plus, I don't know. But then she says, it's such a staple in how people look at marriage and relating. This sentence has no reference, no meaning, no origin. And the word staple, I think, is used to describe something that she isn't talking about or referring to at all. And I don't think staple means what she thinks it means. Then she says, Will and I have been what I would consider kind of the relationship goals. That's a real sentence. Will and I have been what I would consider kind of the relationship goals. I genuinely don't think she's doing this on purpose, and she isn't aware of these fragments uh, making no sense at all. I think for a lot of people in Hollywood, there's a tendency to speak in this way that sounds like it makes sense, but means literally nothing. It's kind of like the people who spend 10, 15 years in college subconsciously start thinking that sounding boring and emotionless means they're an intellectual because their professors sounded that way. See a lot of that. The only time we see respect and true happiness in all of her interviews is when she talks about Tupac. One of those tape replays. I wanted you to walk us through like, what were the stages and how would you define the stages as you do in this book, your stages of your relationship with Will? Mm. Because I feel that that's the part that people get blurry because they're looking at it through their lens. Yeah. But you both have been so clear yeah. about stages of your relationship internally, which I actually think is the hardest part. And so right. how would you define the stages of your partnership with Will that help people understand like the conversations that you're having behind the scenes from like being madly in love to, you know. Yeah. Whew. The stages of getting to the most authentic and it's difficult. So I just want to honor that for a second. Like, it's almost like talking about relationships and the romanticism around the idea of relating is sometimes as detrimental as talking about politics and God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's such, a, it's such a staple in how people look at marriage and relating culturally, mm. right? And all of the romanticism around it. And Will and I have been what I would consider kind of the relationship goals, mm -hmm. this romanticized version. Mm -hmm. I had to, in my own relationship with Will, dissolve my romanticism around what I thought marriage would be, should be. And honestly, we really never had what I would consider the ideal honeymoon stage, you know, even though you do have the honeymoon stage, but our relationship started with some challenges, you know, because he was divorcing. And then our life just took off like a rocket ship. We just took on this huge life in our early 20s. And where his focus was really about, hey, I want to be the biggest movie star in the world. Mm -hmm. And I knew that going into our relationship. And I knew there would be sacrifices with that. And then along the way, and I talk about this in the book, just having those different perspectives. Mm-hmm and really trying to figure out how to reconcile those different perspectives and also deal with a lot of challenges. So I think one of the things that I address in the book in regards to, you know, people thinking that we've had an open marriage and we haven't had an open marriage. I talk about starting off pretty much early on in our marriage of having the need for transparency. And that is a big difference between, hey, you can do whatever you want, you know, versus like, hey, here we are, very young people in this place called Hollywood, 
that has a lot of temptation. Let's have a partnership around this. Let's be very realistic of what this life is. If we're talking about we're going to be together forever and ever and ever, that means there's going to be some temptations that come up. Let's be in partnership and let's talk about that. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, Okay, yeah, just one thing on this, which is just, as I said on the first video, the inability to land on anything solid, tangible events, things that happen with people, things people say, the intention behind those things, you know, the stuff that you might talk about if you're having a a real conversation with somebody to really understand like what is actually really happening for you and other people. What did you do? What did you say? How did that feel to you? No, we've got challenges, transparency, temptation, uh, realistic, partnership, nothing, all good concepts, but this list of concepts, which mean we can't get our fingers on any any event that ever happens. And if we try and get to an event with her, it'll just be thrown up into a, a conceptual area, which means, again, we can't touch it. So she's seen us off the territory with politics and God and culture. And now if we're going to stay in this territory and try and try and analyze what's going on, because we may be just we may be actually interested in it. Again, we can't get a finger hold in in any of it. There's nothing solid uh, in there. Uh, Greg, what do you think? What do you got on this one? You know why? That's because feelings aren't real things. They are only real things to you. They aren't real things to me. They aren't real things to any of us. We can see the symptoms. That's what we're looking for. But they aren't tangible. And this is a person who is living in a world of feelings, in my opinion. And all they do is talk about how they feel and how things are. We didn't hear any facts in almost anything we've heard to now. She'll go in and tell us all of these feelings and how she's going to work. If you watch her, we talk about eye accessing on the show fairly often. You see her going left, going over to this auditory kind of place that she's recalling something. You ask her a conversation and she went, boom. Now we get to start looking and she's going back to the same place for memory. The problem is when you lay down something in your head as rote, something you've read, something you've becomes a mantra for you to use a word, then that kind of becomes just auditory memory. And we're seeing that auditory memory in her as she goes back and she's pulling pieces of conversations or things she's read that are becoming part of her operating system and how she feels and why she feels that way. That's my opinion of this. She overcomes all that Botox or whatever she's had done to her forehead to actually get a wrinkle in her forehead when she says, dissolve my romanticism. And it's actually pretty pronounced as a request for approval. Do you get what I'm saying? And then when we see her move off to the right and up to a different part of her brain, her eyes are moving up high and the opposite side. She's going to talk about something where she's saying, we didn't really have a honeymoon. And she's visualizing that honeymoon, the perfect honeymoon. And then she realizes, well, wait a minute, I'm rich and the rest of the world isn't. And we probably did have a perfect, see those regulators, those stop motions, as you called it, Chase, and she thrust her hand forward to take that over. Really interesting to see. And then after she said, I knew there would be sacrifices because Will wanted to be the world's biggest movie star, you see this taste in her mouth. That's pretty interesting. Then she moves immediately to overpronouncing the word open. And she overpronounces the word open. She does that with words that she's going to try to drive home to you. She then shifts gears and turns into Bill Clinton and redefines a word. I think it's really a good indicator that mostly what we're going to see from her anyway is going to be feelings, not facts. Chase, what do you got? Mark, I want you to elaborate on this, if you can. Is her use of the word romanticism, I don't think that means what she thinks it means. Uh, I think it means she's thinking romantic ideas about a romantic behavior. Uh, but I think romanticism might mean something different. Do you agree with that or no? Well, I think there are two potential meanings here. One is is um, one is the romantic ideal, which would be you know, uh, let's say you know, roses and candles and and riding in on horses, and you know, it'll mean different things to different people. Those are the images that I'm going to pick for this ideal of romanticism. Then there's when you romanticize something, which is make it perfect. Um, so I think there are two possible things that she's that she's picking from. Yeah, there, I would say. 
Yeah, when you were saying the first idea, all I could think was just cut scenes from every season of The Bachelor would be that. <laughs> right, right. That exact thing. So, and, and drinking drinking from a mug like this. With two hands. Mm. Yeah. So she says, we had different ideas about the world. We had to figure out how to reconcile perspectives. We had to deal with challenges. We need transparency in the marriage. Show me someone that... who. I mean, that's every human. That's every relationship in the world. There's just generic blather. It's hollow, generic blather. But this is honest behavior here. And there's no deception, really, about what she's saying. Her cadence is smooth. Her delivery is consistent with her baseline. There's nothing off about her movement, uh, especially with all the stuff that we did find in the last video or some red flags when she interviewed with Hoda. With all that said... There's nothing she's saying that is detailed, transparent, actually conveying an answer to the question. So while we aren't seeing deception here, we're seeing other types of truth avoidance. And there's eight types that I teach in my training. And I'll let you decide which of these eight you're seeing in the video here. You can put it in the comments. There's propagandizing, gaslighting, deception, selective truth, cover-ups, self-enhancement, omission and avoiding. So with that little list, I'll let you decide what you see there. Scott. All right. Here she continues to alight upon the obvious with this profound and original discovery vibe she's got going on. Like, look, I've discovered this. No, you haven't. You're just puking up stuff you've read uh, in these books and on Google. She's just Googling stuff and it's coming. Or maybe she's not Googling, but she's definitely underlining words and phrases in these books and then sitting around thinking about it, memorizing them. And then when she gets the chance, like here is the perfect example, just pukes them out and thinks it makes her sound profound and it doesn't at all. She speaks really slowly so she can construct these sentences with these phrases she knows because I'm sure they're sitting up here in a bubble just, you know, and she just connects with those and starts putting them in order like those little things on a refrigerator where you have all those words and you can make sentences out of them. It's kind of like that because that's what it sounds like when she's, when she speaks, it's, it sounds, I think she thinks it makes her sound intelligent whereas it doesn't. This, this is one of those things that gets to my last nerve where somebody uses th these words and phrases to, to help enhance the, the way they look to someone from an intellectual perspective. And it just, right in the commode it do doesn't work at all here because you get that creepy feeling of what's wrong here and this is what's wrong here so nothing original it's just regurgitation of the things she's read and things she's underlined and and that's all it is if i sound a little bit bent out of shape it's because it I, these kind of things just get on my last nerve when somebody does this and it's so obvious it's it just just it's so bad you're sounding so, like you need some deep healing, Scott, around this. Yeah, yeah I, think I do. Some deep healing. Hey, I'm on my journey, man. I'm on my journey on the path to healing. Your journey. Deep healing. Your journey. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> I need some healing after watching two and a half hours of this video. <laughs> One of those tape replays. I had to in my own relationship with Will, dissolve my romanticism around what I thought marriage would be, should be. And honestly, we really never had what I would consider the ideal honeymoon stage. You know, even though you do have the honeymoon stage, but our relationship started with some challenges, you know, because he was divorcing. And then our life just took off like a rocket ship. We just took on this huge life in our early 20s. And where his focus was really about, hey, I want to be the biggest movie star in the world. Mm -hmm. And I knew that going into our relationship. And I knew there would be sacrifices with that. And then along the way... And I talk about this in the book, just having those different perspectives mm -hmm. and really trying to figure out how to reconcile those different perspectives and also deal with a lot of challenges. So I think one of the things that I address in the book in regards to, you know, people thinking that we've had an open marriage and 
we haven't had an open marriage. I talk about starting off pretty much early on in our marriage of having the need for transparency. And that is a big difference between, hey, you can do whatever you want, you know, versus like, hey, here we are, very young people in this place called Hollywood that has a lot of temptation. Let's have a partnership around this. Let's be very realistic of what this life is. If we're talking about we're going to be together forever and ever and ever, that means there's going to be some temptations that come up. Let's be in partnership and let's talk about that. (laughs) Marriage like, I am going to be... (laughs) My husband is never, ever, ever going to look at anybody else. You know what I mean? Like, I I just, I am just a realist Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I know what it's been like for me. Mm -hmm. Right? When I first came to Hollywood and I could go into the clubs and have anybody, just the, the level of just like, that just, that, the like, you know what I mean? It's just like, you just. Yeah, it's intoxicating. It's so intoxicating. That's one. Now, what I do believe that what people don't know that I talk about in the book a lot is that there have been several breakups between Will and I. Will talks about it, my 40th birthday, mm-hmm. which was a big breakup for us. We were actually looking towards separating and divorcing. And we separated. The world just didn't know. Then we had a reconciliation. And then 2016 came and we had the ultimate break. Mm -hmm. But the world didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where some of the misconception about having an open marriage came into play because we were living lives as single people Mm -hmm. and the world didn't know. Over the span of 12 years of just trying to figure out this thing called love and marriage between Will and I. It's been a trip. And I think that even with that entanglement piece, Mm -hmm. which I talk about extensively Mm -hmm. in the book, Mm -hmm. how I played a part in the misconception of that narrative of allowing myself to be portrayed as an adulteress, allowing myself to be portrayed as someone that had betrayed Will, And that wasn't the case. We broke up in 2016. He went on to live a life as a single man. I went on to live a life as a single woman. And then when we had the talk at the red table, I was going to go to the red table by myself. Uh, All right, Chase, what do you got? Can we go back? I have a mouthful of ice cubes. (laughs) (laughs) I think you got chaw. (laughs) Okay. Chase, what do you got? I think I'm confident here saying that there's a pattern with her using the word right. And she uses that word the moment she's bringing up a topic, which she thinks could incur some form of judgment or criticism. So there's some social buy-in from the interviewer. When someone doesn't use this word often, pay attention when they use it. And you'll start to see the exact situations that make them feel like they need backup or social backup. This can tell you a lot more about their psychology than you might imagine. And there's a slight smile at the word breakups here, which I thought was really bizarre. And I think some people might misinterpret this as being happy about the breakup, but with how fast it comes on to her face, and secondly, how she makes brief eye contact while she's smiling, This is what's called social confirmation smile, or maybe another word for it. But we use this to make sure somebody else is comfortable and that they're still with us in the conversation. And there's a hand gesture she's doing here. Mark picks up on these so much that hopefully I'm taking uh, something away from what he's about to tell you. Get ready to cross it out. There's a hand gesture where she's flipping over a document like this. And then moving the document closer and then further away from somebody with her hand here. This is unusual for her. So I wanted to pay attention. 
And there might have been some document involved with this process she's talking about, like maybe a divorce decree, a prenup or, you know, whatever. I only say this because of her baseline. She's known to illustrate and narrate when she's being truthful. And she does this in a way that she's interacting with an object, which she does all the time. So two incredible pieces of advice that I got from my late grandfather growing up was number one, you have to love your person more than you need them. That's a big deal to understand that. You have to love them more than you need them because when that scale tips, you're in for a huge disaster. And two, only get mad one person at a time. <laughs> All the behavior that I'm seeing here looks like the same unusualness that we see when we when we see Kamala Harris ever talking on any camera ever. It's the same kind of behavior as as you see with Kamala Harris. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, it could be it could be a document too. She could be turning on the gas cooker. I don't know. Could, yeah. be, could, be, one, could be one or the other. Um, well, certainly, look, it is a, a what I've put as a broad performance, a broad performance around this idea of in, the intoxicating nature of being able to have anyone. Her hand comes right up into the ecstatic plane, so she's getting really excited by that. And I, I believe her. I mean, I, you know, when she, you're right, Chase, when she gets more animated, um, it's it's more true i would say to a trained dancer who is being really expressive and i believe every moment of that because she her her body uh you know really fills and all the lines of of energy complete there's nothing flaccid in there um it's quite exciting to watch we can see a really good physical uh performer there for sure um and, and contrast that to when she talks about other stuff that she wants to be more um, obscure and closed around, and she's barriered. You know, so when when we see her cross-legged and and what are traditionally people might say, oh, you know, she's barriered, but we could easily go actually, well, it kind of looks like her baseline. You know, and that might be true, but look what happens when she's excited about something and she becomes a really good, honest storyteller, or certainly maybe not honest, but um, more expressive storyteller because she what she's got clear detail and she wants to get it out. Well, she's big, she's bold, which is great to see. Um, I just picked up on the idea of her talking about love and marriage. Uh, it's a classic Sinatra. Uh, phrase and it just reminded me uh she used lyrics of uh, i'll be there when she was talking about being there for will and it seems to me you know talking about romanticism chase you know often when we're being romantic about something we use you know popular culture or poetry to to explain our lives because you know often we haven't experienced the panoply of life but poets try and, and and artists try and give us what it would be like by creating songs and lyrics and pictures and and so when we're when we're living a situation we'll often talk about it in the poetry of the artists because it's the nearest thing we have so we get love and marriage the sinatra and and uh you know i'll be there um uh i don't think she's using in it in the michael jackson uh sense uh, because she puts her stress on the um, uh, um, on the there rather than the aisle. Anyway, uh, she talks in classic lyrics. She is a romanticist, I would say. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'm just going to cover a couple of things. One is pay attention to what she's talking about when she does this whole move. It's something I call the let me tell you move, not the teaching phase thing, the let me tell you move. You see people narrow and purse their lips. They half swallow when they're talking. They may chew the inside of their mouth. They have their head tilted down and they're rocking their head as they're telling you. They may be doing this or that, but they're telling you something and they're looking down at you. Pay attention to that because that's a let me tell you. And that's a little bit of a, again, a little bit of a um, patronizing move when they're doing that. You see people chewing their mouth when they do it as well. That's one. The second one is when she's talking about positive things about herself, she's large and she's in active voice. Go to the pub, to the bar, pick, have my pick. She's saying these words, not like they happen to her, but like their actions and she has some control. When she gets to the bad things around going to the red table, 
she goes to passive voice, played a part, allowing myself to be portrayed. And then she does that weird adapter where she grabs her leg at going to the red table by myself. Look, this thing's filmed. I think this was a pretty big series and recorded, and it was something she could have said, well, that episode's never going to see the light of day because it was in her house. Her studio was in her house. So you know she has a little more editorial control than she's letting on here. She's a victim by this. She shifted gears and went to that whole passive voice. Don't Not a real big fan of that. Scott, what do you got? All right, so they recorded this in her house? That's her place? Yeah, the, re the Red Table was done red in table. their house. Yeah, not this interview. Yeah. The red oh, table. not this no. one. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah no, the Red the, Table. The, yeah. Okay, great, great. Well, in, in this clip, this is the most animated she gets when she's talking about how famous she is and how she could have her choice of anybody in the club. Let me tell you, let me, ladies, let me give you a little secret here. If you're a woman, <laughs> you can go to any club and have any guy you want in there, just so you know. That's on the table. That's on Scott's beige table. You know, take that with you. Do with it what you will. But know that that is a fact. Now, notice when she talks about herself, she's either really loud or she gets really quiet with that head down a little bit. And then she uses that voice where she sounds like she's just come off the mountain uh, with a tete-a-tete -tete with a burning bush. And she's come down to hip the cattle to the way things are and about her. And it's, it's just mind-blowing, the self absorption that must have gone on before this to, to be able to to let that out of your mouth some of the things she's talking about however these are all cues of confidence some may say overconfidence or super confident but for some reason it's not playing right it just doesn't sound or look right but these are all the things you see in a confident person this is the things we a lot of these things are things we train people to look like when they're going in to whatever the situation is to look confident a lot of this is what that is but for some reason, maybe it's what's coming out of her mouth that's making those things clash together. What's coming off off her from her body language and what she's actually saying? Maybe those are clashing, and that's what it is. I I don't know, but they're all cues of confidence. And like uh, Greg was saying, she's she's. It's not the I'm teaching you something as much as it is I'm. I'm what was the phrase you used, Greg? Listen to me. Yeah. Yeah. The the listen to me. So that let me tell you, uh, listen to me, or is the one I was usually was, use people, Yeah, let me tell you. So yeah, that I think that's what's happening now. I've just slammed her so bad, but let me tell you something. This is this is uh, something that I, I'll have to tell you since I've been talking so bad about her. When we go do Doctor Phil's show, we get we have someone that will come pick us up. Right. And so one of these times I was there by myself and the driver came, pick me up. And I always there's two questions I always ask. The first one is, who's the nicest person you've had to 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 drive or that you've gotten to drive for? Who's the nicest person? Who's the, the best one? And I've had two people tell me Shaquille O'Neal's the nicest one. Uh, they say that guy, this one guy told me, he said, look, I won't use his name. But he said, when we go somewhere, we go to these really nice restaurants and I drop him off. He says, what do you want? And, and even when he said, even when he says, I don't want anything, he sends the waiter out and he says, he told me I have to, I have to take something. You have to tell me what you want to eat or I can't go back in there. And so he tells them what he wants to eat and they oh, bring nice. out this big layout for him to eat the driver. And I thought that was so cool. Now, having said that, I said, who's the worst? And, and one of them said, Will Smith is the worst. And I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, what makes him the worst? And he said, he, he, when he gets in the car, he he never says hello, never says anything, doesn't address me. And then when he needs something, he just keeps looking down and says, get my bags or do this or do whatever. And when we get out of the car, yeah. we always sort of open the door and get out ourselves. He waits for the guy to come around and let him out of the door. Nothing wrong. Some people are like that. And he said, however, the one, th the, the one thing that the good that came out of that was his wife. Jada, he said, she is so nice and she is always so pleasant to me. She is the nicest person. Every time I've, I've, I've driven for them, she comes out and apologizes for the way he acts once he, once he's in. And I said, and I said, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. He said, no, she is the sweetest thing. She he said, I really like her a lot. So there's that. There's that, the juxtaposition of that as to what we're seeing. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I hope I don't get that guy in trouble. Should I put that story in or not? I don't know, but I, I love it that we're now a Hollywood gossip channel. Uh, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's what that's turning into. Like, like we're now OK I Magazine. I, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with nothing that. Nothing wrong yeah. with that story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's funny. It's it's we're OK it. Magazine. We're, no. we're now I, who, who, Who would, how would they know it's him? There's a thousand drivers in LA. Yeah. OK. All right.
Or is that all of us? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. One of those tape replays. Marriage like, I am going to be. <laughs> My husband <laughs> is never, ever, ever going to look at anybody else. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, you know, I just, I am just a realist mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I know what it's been like for me. Mm-hmm. Right? When I first came to Hollywood and I could go into the clubs and have anybody, just the the level of just like that, just the the (laughs) like, you know what I mean? It's just like you just yeah, intoxicating. It's so intoxicating. That's one. Now, what I do believe that what people don't know that I talk about in the book a lot is that there have been several breakups between Will and I. Will talks about it my 40th birthday, Mm -hmm. which was a big breakup for us. We were actually looking towards separating and divorcing and we separated. The world just didn't know. Then we had a reconciliation and then 2016 came and we had the ultimate break, Mm -hmm. but the world didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where some of the misconception about having an open marriage came into play because we were living lives as single people Mm -hmm. and the world didn't know. Over the span of 12 years of just trying to figure out this thing called love and marriage between Will and I, it's been a trip. And I think that even with that entanglement piece, Mm -hmm. which I talk about extensively in the book, Mm -hmm. how I played a part in the misconception of that narrative of allowing myself to be portrayed as an adulteress, allowing myself to be portrayed as someone that had betrayed Will. And that wasn't the case. We broke up in 2016. He went on to live a life as a single man. I went on to live a life as a single woman. And then when we had the talk at the red table, I was going to go to the red table by myself Mm -hmm. to talk about the entanglement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Will decided he wanted to come with me and we were going to then tell the world, hey, we haven't been together. And this happened during that time. Well, when we got to the table, Will wasn't ready. He wasn't ready. He wasn't ready for the world to know that. I had to respect that. Well, I didn't have to, but I wanted to. But I was ready. I was ready to let go of the persona I had created around myself that had put me in a golden cage. I wanted to let that go. And so I had to stay on my journey. I had to stay on my path while also respecting Mm. that Will wasn't ready. So I said, you know what? This is my mess anyway. I'm going to take this heat because guess what? The heat is coming either way, whether when we decide to get divorced, when we decide to separate, whatever, whatever. This is my practice run. Strip it down. Let it go, Jada. And then let's see what's left. I didn't have to put that particular show out, but I had already gotten myself so ready for that journey for myself. And to me, that was moving closer to my freedom than holding back and creating a narrative that I felt like was just going to entrap me more. And as difficult as it's been, because the irony is I spent so much of our relationship having this open communication between the between he and I, creating this beautiful friendship of authenticity and um, honesty. And so to be labeled as someone who had cheated on him was devastating. But it also put me in a position where I had to learn how to let go of what anybody thought about me and really be 10 toes down on understanding who I am and being able to walk in that no matter what anybody thought about me. But I needed that journey for myself. You know, it's kind of like that is the walk. When they talk about walking on hot coals, it's like creating that level of when we talk about that inner world work, 
and creating that like strong foundation within yourself of knowing exactly who you are, no matter what other people think about you. I mean, I've gotten that to a certain degree. And so that was a very challenging moment. And I talk about it in the book. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, a handful of things. She has her brow up and her lips pursed. And when she says Will wasn't ready, that that's condemning to me. And then there's one of her brows is higher than the other skepticism. So there's clearly some irritation there. We can't tell what we can just see the symptoms we're talking about. One of the things to point out, you know, we're talking about Jada because she's the one talking and relationships are sticky, nasty, messy things. We don't know what happened in the past that might have been an egregious act to her that caused her to behave a certain way with Will Smith. We don't know any of that. So we're only trying to read symptoms and what we can see. We're not trying to tell you what's going on inside the relationship, except for how we see things playing out in a conversation and our opinions. There's a shift in tones and she elongates again, which says, I was ready and batoning, she drives her point home. Then she talks about her journey, her path and healing. Well, this might be healing for her and it might not be healing for him had a cat i might name it jada you know that might be a just kind of poking around and toying with somebody as they're in that situation and you're back and forth where do you think is going to happen what kind of healing do you think is going to happen when you go going to say hey we were separated and i had an affair or i you know had this relationship but you don't include that we were separated part what do you think that outcome is going to be is there a logic piece missing here in thinking about what will happen is that healing is the question that comes to me. The big thing to me that's missing here are the hard questions from the interviewer. And I don't think that's the kind of interview it is. I would have said, what the hell were you thinking? Didn't you know this would turn out bad? And then she does that last thing where she says, I didn't have to put this show out. I agree with her. She didn't have to. And you see her foot flex. So probably there's some maybe remorse. Who knows what showing up there? Uh, Chase, what do you got? Uh, entanglement is something that I experience annually, and it's with Christmas lights that are stuffed into old Amazon boxes. And other than a few jujitsu classes, I've not really been entangled with a human. So it's interesting, these extra words that are outside of norm uh, that she uses for all of the stuff. And her repeating, he wasn't ready, three times is significant here. Her body language is all flowing and honest, which doesn't mean she's being transparent. So let's make that distinction. Honest and transparent are not the same thing. So there's something in her psychology about his lack of readiness that I would pick up on as an interviewer here. And I would keep that phrase in my back pocket because she's exposing what's called a reasoning process. So when you hear these in somebody's speech, you know that these are powerful phrases that you can later use to help them open up or make a decision later in the conversation. And then she says, the heat is coming. I'm assuming she means from people she doesn't know. And that's the trouble with living in what she refers to here as a persona. It means you will be emotionally affected by strangers you don't even know. Like if someone I don't know leaves a mean comment on our video and it hurts me, that means I have a very serious problem with reality. So if you're struggling with judgment from people who don't know you, there's a problem with you knowing you. That's the big issue here. Her talking about knowing herself and being in herself and not even knowing who she is enough to be unaffected by these people's opinion. So her behavior here is similar to baseline from the other videos, which is restrained, uh, self-soothing at every point she's talking about will and consistently seeking social confirmation from the interviewer. And this is likely a mirror to her life. Think about those three things that I just said. It's a mirror to her life since we see it in most of her interviews. And she's still not speaking a word about Will's journey, his character, his desires, his integrity, only him not being ready. And I'll leave that to you to make a guess at what that means. And it will be a guess. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, I couldn't agree with you more on the uh, 
Will wasn't ready, and here, here's why. With with my journey and closer to my freedom, we get really strong, direct, down, uh, it would be actually down her wheel plane, which is like that center plane there, if she didn't have a mic in front of her. I think she's only to the side of it because she can't come right down her wheel plane there, which means she's very direct and very decided about my journey and closer to my freedom. Then we get this great control gesture here a couple of times um, on my mess, my heat. Again, direct, clear, c- controlling. We get we get strip it down where she comes right down the side at an at an angle and and really cuts the air. And I'll talk in our in our next uh, video about what I think she's talking about in terms of strip it down because we will see her repeat that gesture with a different a different phrase. But with Will wasn't there, we get the hand coming out and we get we get no line of energy there. So if you imagine, you know, with all these things here, if she had an object in her hand, she would not drop that object. If she had a ball in her hand, it would still be there. The ball in her hand over here would just fall off her fingers and fall onto the floor. She, she drops the ball on that. And that shows a very definite feeling, I would say, in how she talks about control and will wasn't ready so there may be something um about about him not being um powerful enough because these are really powerful gestures i don't mean powerful enough in terms of his hollywood status there's no nobody more powerful probably but there was clearly for her something that's lacking in him something that is that is limp around around that you know an energy that isn't there i would say um uh and she talks about the internal relationship again and authenticity and honesty and i'll come back to this idea of the internal and the external in our next uh video scott what do you got on this one uh, th- th- i'm not seeing any cues of deception here i mean there's nothing to be deceptive about these are just confident cues of a skilled communicator and i really think she's a skilled Mm -hmm. communicator she's an actress or actor however you say it these days and i think she's doing a great job of getting what she wants to say across however from a psychological perspective let's listen let's talk about what she's talking about whenever you start explaining things to the world and your concern is what how the world sees you and you start telling uh, people what you've been doing because you've decided to tell the world what you're doing the level of narcissism in that may be unrivaled when when get to that point here oh she gets better <laughs> if, if, you, if you if you think the world is concerned whether or not you're getting the world is just, is concerned whether or not you're getting a divorce how removed from reality must you be Earlier, I said what a sweetheart she was and how wonderful she was to this this guy. And I, I think that's fantastic. But there's something here that separates that. Maybe she's maybe this is a character she's playing or something. That's the only thing I can think of. Maybe this is just her her public persona that we're seeing. And the other one is who she really is. She's that that sweetheart, that nice person, makes sure everything's good, takes care of people, apologizes for other people's mistakes, even who are in her group or whatever, to make sure everything's okay. Because when you start talking about the world and what the world thinks about you, well, if I ever say something like that, you call <laughs> somebody, call Dr. Phil, and get in here. Tell him he needs to go up in there and get tweak some things, man, because that's not that's not right. That's not right. And again, she talks about, like Mark was saying, she talks about herself and her journey. And But her illustrators are all falling in the right place. Everything is is where it should be and as it should be. And, uh, and uh, I, 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 I don't feel, I'm, I might feel sorry for her because she's putting all this stuff out there. And I think that might be the new personality she's moving for, to from this persona we're seeing or that she was before to this new one. She's created a new person that she's becoming. And maybe that's why she's saying all these things like this, but that's not a lot to do with body language. It's mostly from the, the psychology side of it, but still that, that this is some odd behavior we're seeing from someone who is other than this has, has not done anything weird or, 
are, are out of the ordinary as far as I'm, I'm aware. So, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I, but you, you said it's not body language. It is behavior. And that's after all, what yeah. we are is behavior yeah. panel. Yeah. For me, one of the interesting, you, you're dancing around something very specific here, in my opinion. And that is every time we interrogate, if you've ever interrogated a prisoner, it's about finding the role you're going to talk to and pulling that person forward. And that every one of us is many roles. You know, you're a father, a brother, a, whatever you are in your life. And you're, a, you know, a, a, somebody who gives advice. You're whatever your role is. You might be a fireman. You might be whatever. I don't want to talk to the tough role. I want to pick that weak role and pull that weak role out and show them how fragile their little egos are. And if she is playing her only card out front, and this is really who she is, and she's worried about whether people, how people feel about her divorce, that's that's dangerous territory, Chase, to your point. And I, just, I'm thinking about all the people that are watching right now. What Greg just said is worth at least $10,000. If you take that piece of advice about speaking to certain roles, and Mark, I cannot believe you didn't get the golden cage thing. Oh, uh, the golden cage is like a Hare Krishna uh, key principle of like the bird is dying inside the cage, but we're polishing the outside. Yeah, it's also a song by a band called The Whitest Boy Alive. Mm. Pretty yeah. good song. Easy. It's a classic music hall song. I'm only a, a bird in a gilded cage. It's uh, yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful British music hall song. But the last question I have is, did anybody else notice in the interview, she said they were never going to divorce, but she's talking about divorce here? Yeah. I mean, a lot of that. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. All over the place. Well, that was the other persona. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, the one she should have brought to the dance. One of those tape replays. To talk about the entanglement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Will decided he wanted to come with me. And we were going to then tell the world, hey, we haven't been together. And this happened during that time. Well, when we got to the table, Will wasn't ready. He wasn't ready. He wasn't ready for the world to know that. I had to respect that. Well, I didn't have to, but I wanted to. But I was ready. I was ready to let go of the persona I had created around myself that had put me in a golden cage. I wanted to let that go. And so I had to stay on my journey. I had to stay on my path while also respecting mm. that Will wasn't ready. So I said, you know what? This is my mess anyway. I'm gonna take this heat because guess what? The heat is coming either way, whether when we decide to get divorced, when we decide to separate, whatever, whatever. This is my practice run. Strip it down. Let it go, Jada. And then let's see what's left. I didn't have to put mm -hmm. that particular show out, but I had already gotten myself so ready for that journey for myself. And to me, that was moving closer to my freedom than holding back and creating a narrative that I felt like was just going to entrap me more. And as difficult as it's been, because the irony is I spent so much of our relationship having this open communication between, the, between he and I, creating this beautiful friendship of authenticity and um, honesty. And so to be labeled as someone who had cheated on him was devastating. But it also put me in a position where I had to learn how to let go of what I didn't, anybody thought about me and really be 10 toes down on understanding who I am and being able to walk in that no matter what anybody thought about me. But I needed that journey for myself. You know, it's kind of like that is the walk when they talk about walking on hot coals. It's like creating that level of when we talk about that inner world work and creating that like strong foundation within yourself of knowing exactly who you are, no matter what other people think about you. I mean, I've gotten that to a certain degree. And so that was a very challenging moment. 
And I talk about it in the book. When, when that is there and it's being deconstructed, someone would look at you and be like, why would you do that? Like, yep. why, why do I need to know? Why? And really, I, I just want to highlight and I want you to share about that, that the intention was healing. Absolutely. The intention wasn't to save face or the intent. And I know this because we were talking about it. Like, yeah. The intention wasn't to... Uh, yeah, it wasn't to save face. And yeah, it surely yeah. wasn't. And I need people to know. I didn't ask Bill to come to the table. Yeah, yeah. That was not my idea. Mm -hmm. Will wanted to come to the table because he didn't want me to be there by myself. He had all the best intentions yeah. and got there and was, I think his trauma response kicked in. Like, I'm not ready. So many people were like, don't do this. And I'm like, nah, I'm doing it. For myself. For myself. Because I want to live. Because the I'm ready. I don't want this whole thing anymore. This whole Jada will, I'm done with that. It was part of the work that I was ready for and it was what I needed. And everybody's in different places in their journey. Also, that's also a dynamic I had to look at within myself in regards to, so it was two things. There's this healthy Jada is like, tear it down. I want to, I don't want that persona anymore. Tear my ego down. Yeah. And there was this other part of me that was like, oh my God, I need to, you know, People he's not ready. Me. You know, he's not ready. My, you know, codependency kicks in and I go, this is what I do. I'm the martyr. I can do the martyr thing. So once again, it's both things. It's healing. Like, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready for, I'm ready for the tear down. And then this martyr that's like, and I want to make sure, Will, as long as you're okay, I'm okay. That's part of my relationship with my mother's addiction that I brought into my relationship with Will that created a certain dynamic within myself in my relationship with him that I also needed to get my eyes on that I didn't see. Mm -hmm. That that needed to be healed as well. Without that table, without that moment, I would have never recognized that. As painful as it was for people to watch, existential disappointment in a collective. I'm so sorry, I wish it could have happened another way. I'm sorry that it had to be so messy in front of everybody. I'm sorry, but I needed that. What I got to clear up, what I got to clean up, what I got to see, and to be able to sit here with you today and embrace it all and have so much acceptance for myself for all of the choices I've made. And people ask me, if you had to do it over again, would you do it any different? I don't think so. All right, Chase, what do you got? Let's kick it off with saying, she says it wasn't to save face and I need people to know. That's what saving face is. I need to go back and make sure everybody knows. And I thought that was stunning that those were in the same sentence there. And then you're, you're going to see this. You're going to see this little shoulder shrug here is out of baseline for her, and it spikes the moment that she's saying she didn't ask Will to come to the table. So if you're not familiar with that gesture, it means that a person might be lacking in confidence in what they're saying. And we also see a really pronounced lip retraction here. The lips go back into the mouth, and you're going to see that. And there's, and there's rapid no head shaking, which is way outside of her contained and restrained baseline here. So this is just a cluster, not just a single behavior, but a cluster of uncertainty and deviation from baseline. When she says, uh, that was not my idea. Again, another shoulder shrug, and you know what that means. And, uh, and she says a few things about healing, and I'm not sure how healing needs to be done on camera in front of millions of people. I've never seen that psychology textbook that, that uh, talks about that. Maybe it's a new thing. And her issues are all from external sources, nothing about her. And there's nothing internally that, that's really coming forward here. And there's anger clearly on her face when she's speaking about uh, a couple of these things. 
And she's saying, I wish it could have happened another way. I don't believe this at all. And I'm willing to bet anything. She's heard of a therapist, a room without a camera, a counselor, or even talking at a kitchen table that might be wood instead of red. Uh, she's saying, I, I don't think it could have happened any other way. I think that's uh, so strange to hear. And I think she's also very aware of a delete button when it comes to recording and then deleting a video. Since the healing took place, why publish the video? So this is all just responsibility shedding. And when healing absolutely has to happen in public, it's not a person healing. It's a persona that's healing because the public has to participate. So it's a persona that's being healed, not a person. So this has so many hallmarks of what I think is a sunk cost fallacy that seems to be this relationship, the sunk cost fallacy. If you don't know what that is in psychology, you can Google it, or maybe one of you guys will roll into that. Greg? It's in the book. It's in the book. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) buy my book. Yeah. (laughs) So, Chase, I'm going to hit a couple of points you just hit, just add. I'm going to see your cluster of a rising shoulder, lip withdrawal, um, short stroke nodding, I'm going to add to that eye blocking. She just does all that when she says, it wasn't my idea to bring Will to the table. So all of that makes us have less than confident belief that that's true. There's also the piece you were just covering about her feeling the need to be in front of people. She actually says out loud a couple of things that I find interesting. She thought that their relationship breaking up caused us pain. I candidly don't remember when I found out they were breaking up or that she had had an affair. The only time I even know is because I watched these videos and this was two and a half hours of it. All this talk, if you're putting up with this all the time, I can't imagine. This is a combination of self-help books. You said it, Scott, there's some self-help. There's some real therapy in here around being a martyr and around not being able to control her mother's addiction and those kinds of things. There's some other pieces in here. There's some Hare Krishna stuff we heard. There's even, we're going to hear something that sounds a little bit like Scientology coming up. So she's got a mix of all these things that she's created a whole new religion. And this, whatever you want to call it, whether it's your belief system, your whatever, it becomes a religion when you're doing all of this. And I need to heal. And okay, your healing is one thing. But as I listen to her talking about Will Smith was not ready, but she went ahead and did this. Is there a healing part for him? Is this deep healing for him or deep healing for her? And then it gets to be pretty subjective in whose religion it is that you're enforcing. And I'm not a big fan of people enforcing their religion on me in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Maybe it's because of where I come from and all that kind of thing. But it gets pretty subjective after that. So, yeah, Scott, he does. she does one thing in here that you're talking about a lot, and that's the teaching phase. Say some words, watch you. As soon as you get it, say some words, watch you. you. Well, it's all over here. It is all over here. You explain it. And and so anyway, the self-importance, is, there's just a lot of stuff. If you really want some healing, watch this show. Scott, what do you what do you yeah, got? Good. <laughs> um, I know it sounds like we're we're bashing therapy, but we're actually not. No, that is no. if if you if you need that, if you've if you've experienced trauma or something like that, go do that. It I've seen it change people's lives, make them from just the the living a mundane uh, life, they go to therapy, man, they come out and they're actually happy. Their lives change because somebody said, no, man, you're looking at this from the the wrong perspective. Look at it like this. And they go like that. They go, holy smokes, you're right. That's that's such an important thing to to keep in mind as, as we're going through this. We're not slamming therapy. We're not slamming somebody getting help for that. We're specifically talking about this one person in this one video or one group of videos. That's it. So if if you are in therapy, don't get out because we're still, we're talking about her. No, talking for about sure. She thinks for she's sure. A I don't want you to think that's what I said by any stretch. Oh no, no, no. You didn't. That's yeah. no. I'm just saying. I want everybody to know that while we're sitting here talking because <laughs> I've been leading into it over here about how she thinks she's a guru. But still, at the same time, for real, if, if for therapy stuff, man, you do it. Do it. At least check it out. If, you, if something's up or something's wrong or you're, you know, things seem like they're going a little bit sideways on you, do that. It gets you fixed quick. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. Well, look, maybe she, she is making that journey towards the possibility of that guru status. Here's maybe why. She does a, a big ecstatic 
a wipeout gesture um, right at the top there around, I think, the the external world that she's talking about around. Then she does this this gesture that I was talking about before, cutting through. And, uh, and instead of strip down, she says, tear down the ego. Um, so look, the, the, if she's using the Freudian idea of the ego, and I don't know what I, idea or ideal she has about that, you've, you've got your, your, your id, which is like that, that, that authentic, um, animal, let's say, um, reaction to stuff. And then you've got, uh, the part of you that kind of projects out that other people see. And then you've got your ego, which is the, like the mediator, the moderator between the two of those things. And if you tear down that ego, there now is nothing between, you know, your um, reactive feelings and the thing that projects out to other people. So people are going to see the internal you. There's no moderator in between. And there's no moderator for you. There's nothing protecting you anymore socially or even uh, personality-wise from, from, you know, the outside world's reaction to who you are. Well, you know, if you go through that process of tearing down the ego, like some people do it in monasteries of some sort, and it takes them a long, long time. Some people can manage to do it with some very, very strong d drugs, you know, and it, and it's like, you know, that'll that'll sort things out for, for a few moments. And then it's like, then you, you spring back again. It's like, wow, what happened there? I was totally egoless. You know, like everything seemed to make sense for a moment. And I really felt like me and it all kind of felt felt right at the time so you can you know there's a couple of ways there's some other ways you can you can you can i mean you know uh you can get you know metal spikes and stick them through yourself and you know hang from ropes and all kinds there's all kinds of stuff you can you can you can do if you want to if you want to go down that route but it's but most of it is 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 monastic or very very counterculture um or just plain dangerous just plain dangerous to do so it's not that you can't do that but usually you've marked yourself out as having some kind of a uh, very pure kind of spiritual journey that you're now on and 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 uh, you know many a many go on that journey and few come back with the results that they were hoping for because it's a pretty tricky journey but those that do come back from that uh, egoless often become teachers of spirituality and that's maybe why they went on that so look maybe she is on that on that journey uh, who am i to 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 say uh, you know, it's not it's not my story to tell, is it? It's not my story to tell. So uh, so let's let's see. Right, right. And I, you're right, Scott. You know, none of us here are saying anything that that um, of 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 that therapy or all, or spirituality is a, is a bad place. It's a fantastic place to go. Uh, but you know, you, you, one would have to be careful, I think not to have a kind of a boil in the bag approach to it, which is like, if I just take a whole bunch of ready-made recipes and dip them together in the same pan of boiling water, that I'll come out with some kind of, you know, three-star Michelin meal. It's like, no, it won't work like that. Mark, I had my notes further down. This is a low country boil approach to religion. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, okay. One of those tape replays. When when that is there and it's being deconstructed, someone would look at you and be like, "Why would you do that? Like, yeah. why why do I need to know?" Why? And really, I, I just want to highlight and I want you to share about that that the intention was healing. Absolutely. The intention wasn't to save face or the intent. And I know this because we were talking about it. Like, yeah. The intention wasn't to. Yeah, it wasn't to save face, and yeah, it surely yeah. wasn't. And I need people to know I didn't ask Bill to come to the table. Yeah, yeah. That was not my idea. Mm -hmm. Will wanted to come to the table because he didn't want me to be there by myself. He had all the best intentions yeah. and got there and was, I think his trauma response kicked in. Like, I'm not ready. So many people were like, don't do this. And I'm like, nah, I'm doing it. For myself. For myself. Because I want to live. Because the I'm ready. I don't want this whole thing anymore this whole jada will i'm done with that it was part of the work that i was ready for and it was what i needed and everybody's in different places in their journey also 
that's also a dynamic I had to look at within myself in regards to. So it was two things. There's this healthy Jade is like, tear it down. I want to, I don't want that persona anymore. Tear my ego down. Yeah. And there was this other part of me that was like, oh my God, I need to pretend, you know, People he's not ready. Me. You know, he's not ready. My, you know, codependency kicks in and I go, this is what I do. I'm the martyr. I can do the martyr thing. So once again, it's both things. It's healing. Like I'm ready. Like I'm ready for, I'm ready for the tear down. And then this martyr that's like, and I want to make sure, Will, as long as you're okay, I'm okay. That's part of my relationship with my mother's addiction that I brought into my relationship with Will that created a certain dynamic within myself, mm -hmm. in my relationship with him that I also needed to get my eyes on that I didn't see. Mm -hmm. That that needed to be healed as well. Without that table, without that moment, I would have never recognized that. As painful as it was for people to watch, existential disappointment in a collective. I'm so sorry. I wish it could have happened another way. I'm sorry that it had to be so messy in front of everybody. I'm sorry. But I needed that. What I got to clear up, what I got to clean up, what I got to see. And to be able to sit here with you today and embrace it all and have so much acceptance for myself for all of the choices I've made. And people ask me, if you had to do it over again, would you do it any different? I don't think so. And so I, I wanted to talk to you about, you know, I think when, when it all went down on Oscars night, the, and you talk about this in the book, and so I want to leave everyone to read about it in full, but the, but the perception was that you were so offended that you'd kind of urge this action, which is bizarre in and of itself for so many reasons that you lay out in the book. But I want to hear from you, like, what were you actually hurt by about the condition that you were going through? And in that gap between what we saw yeah. and what we didn't get to see, which everyone had their own theory on, what was actually your thought space? So where were you? Let me start with, yeah, that totally. was a really layered moment. Let me start with also that there was so much that people didn't know in regards to what was happening with Will and I at that time. And I, I will leave for people to get the Read book. The, yeah, absolutely. Because there's so much history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you go into Present, it, yeah, you break it down. I break yeah. it down. Hence right? why I did not. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's so much history that I think would give people a lot more context to understand that moment. Let me also say that I know that was a difficult moment to watch because of history that Chris and I had um, in regards to the 2016 Oscar So White. And I'll let people read to get up to speed on that. But... When I first saw Chris's name come on stage, come up as one of the presenters, I said, oh boy. I looked to Will and I was like, he's not going to be able to help himself. This is going to be something. I was like, I knew. I already knew. And I was like, okay. So Will had been going back and forth backstage all night. So when Chris said what he said, I looked to Will as if to say, see, I knew it, <laughs> right? Um, and then I was like, oh boy, that's not cool to like talk about a medical condition that people, okay, there's nothing you can, like it's, it's, it's not something that can be cured, right? And that how many stories I had heard of people, you know, young people committing suicide and the shame and just how many people suffer. And you don't even know, like once I had the condition and I saw how many people around me had, it, I was like, all these years I didn't know. And people express the shame, the level of shame they had around it. I'm going to be okay. As far as my condition, and as you can see, my hair is growing back. That's what it does. It'll grow. It'll fall out. It'll grow back again pieces of my eyebrows will fall out, grow back. You know, I'm having a good moment right now. 
my alopecia is not as extreme as most people who are dealing with that condition. And I just felt like that's not okay. So I wasn't, I wasn't upset about me. And I, I don't remember actually rolling my eyes. I think what people saw was me looking at Will going, I told you, I knew he was going to do that. And oh boy, here we go again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was kind of the thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. oh, here we go. But I wasn't upset about me. I really wasn't. It wasn't about me. It was just all the stories I had heard and that I continue to hear about people who have suffered from this condition. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, she starts off with this so much history, and she says that in an elongated fashion. And I think that is probably her, again, broadcasting what her key things she thinks about. Her baseline's fundamentally changed here, but she sits back and she does that whole hand thing she's doing differently. But she is supporting what she's saying with her words as she goes through this. Like, I'm, I'm going to cut short on the body language piece here. I, do we think that she went in that night and said, go slap him if he does something goofy? I don't, I don't think so. I think, like she said, the history from your relationship boils up. A lot of stuff adds up. People do things. That tells you that one person's journey to healing might not help the other person at all, whatever that healing is. And you, we have no idea what has gone on inside their relationship. People have been together however many years they've been, 30 years, whatever it is. There's all kinds of baggage, all kinds of cues, all kinds of things. They're a microculture. And I always talk about microcultures, meaning two people can have so many signals between them. If you're involved with somebody right now, you probably have signals that tell somebody something across the room that no one else will pick up on. They may pick up that you're doing something, but they probably can't pick up the the detail in what that means to the other person. I, my wife's Greek and she's always saying, God, I wish you spoke Greek because there are times I want to say something to you in a, in a room that I can't. And I said, don't worry, I can see it in your body language all the time. And you can cause a person to behave a certain way, not because you intend to, but because of all the history that goes with it. I think all of us are guilty of some of that. Even the four of us who've been together for now three and a half years can get on each other's nerves with something we do or say that's subtle because the other person has seen it enough times. Imagine you spend 25 years every day with somebody and take into account people who have enough money that they don't have to go out every day to earn a living and who are always together probably are doing more of that in a more cyclic fashion. And the other problem is, and this happens to all of us, happened to a lot of people during COVID, the narrower your group of people get, the more you have to satisfy your Maslow in odd ways, because now in when you go to work, there's the dumb guy, there's the person who's a pain in your ass, there's all these people. But when there's only two of you, you're going to fill those roles for each other. So we have to be really careful when we're judging from outside. And I want you to hear that about this relationship as well. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Um, look, ultimately, here's what I learned from 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 that one is that we cannot trust anything that a Hollywood ceremony delivers to us. We've got we've got a couple turning up that as far as we're concerned as a as a public are a, a couple, their husband and his wife. As far as there's no information that tells me that that's not the case. Zero. Nothing. Nothing at all. And we find out that the outer world is not reflective at all of this inner world, that there is an ego or a superego there that is absolutely carefully moderating what we as a public get to see, and then says, well, you know, um, it's kind of your fault that you don't you don't understand this. Why? Because, you know, it's layered. It's it's layered and it's complex, and you'll understand it if you read the book. But but unless if you don't read the book and get yourself up to speed, then you'll be you'll be slow. So we as the public end up as we're slow idiots because there's this moderation system that's deciding what we can and cannot see of of the inner reality of of Hollywood. Doesn't doesn't sound like my fault. Somebody who was called, you know, slow at school and a bit behind and a bit stupid. I'm like, no, I don't think I am. I don't think that's my fault. I don't think you're teaching me very well. I don't think you're giving me all the information. Then you're going to blame it on me. No, I don't don't buy that at all. Well, says in the end, look, I was just there as family. Just there as family. It's all I was there for. So to your point, Greg, it is that, well, you know, family do affect each other. <laughs> You know, family and have, family without family, family. family and family without family. You know, we've said it once, we've said it a thousand times. Um, 
So they do affect each each other and saying I was just there as a member of the family doesn't make you any less culpable. Yes, I don't I don't think you'd you'd walked in there and gone if Chris Rock says anything bad, give him a smack. I don't think you gave anybody that look at all. But you are family and you and you are part of the you know, it's either him or you and him or him or you. It's probably a combination of all of those things, I w- I would imagine. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, this is her saying, we've deceived you for a very long time, and you have a problem understanding the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's your fault. Uh, One thing in this video that you're going to see is Jay, who I subscribe to on YouTube, gets a little uncomfortable about plugging the book so much here. You can see a very uncharacteristic shuffling with his feet. Uh, I know... This is not something he does often. I watch Jay's videos pretty regularly. And with Jada, the facial touching here goes from zero to a hundred. And it's all wiping her nose and stuff already. She's saying, I knew, I already knew as a single shrug uh, here and then back down to locked body language. And then she says, that whole look was, see, I knew it. There's more social approval seeking because she says, see, I knew it, right? She's asking for approval from Jay. And I think this is revisionist as there was no enjoyment or happiness in this moment. But she's trying to rewrite that back into that moment. And she's increasing her use of this word right. And her eyes are closing, which Greg frequently calls this eye blocking, which you've probably heard Greg say before or Scott or me. This long period while she's telling us this complex and detailed process of medical conditions and stories in her mind at this moment. But here's what's actually happening in this video, and you're going to see it, and you won't unsee it after I tell you this. She gives us two completely separate stories about the reaction to the joke from Chris. Story number one, she's sad and upset and hurting for all the people who suffer from alopecia. Story two, she's smiling and laughing it off that she knew it was going to happen all along. Those are two separate stories being told in the exact same 60-second time span. Scott, what do you got? Well, this is my favorite one so far because we see a great example of watching an answer being constructed, being created and constructed, structured, and then let go. When he asks that first question, her head goes down. She closes off the world so she can think by herself, so she can get in there and start thinking as she drops her head. And then she clasps, clasps her hands and she looks straight down and pauses. And she didn't have done a whole lot of, of long pauses. I think this is the longest one so far. And that lets the interview, interviewer know, hang on a second, I'm getting ready to say something. So that gives her a little, a little um, a pause button on him so he won't say anything. Then she uses her hands to illustrate distance and time, this thing here. When she talks about uh, uh, people didn't know, that's when she clasped her hands together. And that let, lets you know it's something important because she's bringing this together all to the middle and going, hey, look at this. Check this out. This is really important. Her voice gets lower just a little bit, not a whole lot, as she starts firing that off. Then when she talks about um, what's hap- what was happening with Will and I, she moves her hands over to the left. So that's where she's making the creating the space, the distance with whatever happened with those two from whatever it happened. And then she has them pressed together and she's illustrating when she says so much history, because again, that's important to her when she's taught that's, I think these are the most important things we're hearing. And she's trying to really make a point and get it across in a strong uh, manner or method. That's the one she uses. And then when she says, um, I'll let people read. Then you see an edit uh, to, to get up to speed on that. So I, th- that's another the case. I don't know what we missed in there, but there was more than one or two seconds in there. I think I don't think it was 30 seconds or a big thing. She went off on, on talking about something, but there's definitely an edit there and her hands are in a different spot. So go back and forth a couple of times and watch that. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Then she starts goofing around with her nose as she's talking about Chris and the Oscars. And we can she's got a, see she's got a slight gastric upset, and that's we, we call that the, the psychogenic belching. We've seen that with uh, what's his name Robert Durst in the video we did on him when he was talking about the murders. Then he got a little bit um, a little bit uh, burpy there, I guess you'd say. 
but that psychogenic belching. Now we've also seen it on who's the other person we saw that on the the uh, it was a she woman. She was a cop. And Stephanie she, Lazarus. Stephanie, Stephanie Lazarus. Stephanie, yeah, 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 she's really Stephanie bad. Lazarus. Yeah. yeah. So th- we can see the stress level growing as she starts to talk. And later later on, people are going to hear her sniff, and they're going to say, ah, maybe it's drugs or something like that. I think it's just left over from when she was goofing with her nose earlier. Maybe it itched. Maybe she got a little emotional, and that's why she was messing around with it. Um, and then she touches and crosses her chest a couple of times during this, several times during this, when she's talking about alopecia. And I really do think... Like some people are I, Greg and I were talking today. I said, does your hair grow back when you get alopecia? And he said, I, I don't know. I have no earthly idea. Maybe sometimes it does or doesn't. I think it does for some people, depending on how bad it is. I have no earthly idea, anything about alopecia, but it's, uh, I believe her when she says that's happening. I really believe she, she has that. we got a lot of comments where people said, I don't think she has alopecia. That's a lot. I think she actually has it because she's showing all the, the body language of true concern, not just like, you know, I'm really concerned about so-and-so she's doing, she's doing the, the, the classics that we know. And I don't think she's paying attention to that when she's crossing her heart like that. Now I always read the comments. I get in there and, and I'll put hearts by, if you've commented, you get in, you say, I put, you get a heart by it. It's usually me 90% of the time. Cause I, I, I go through every day and I try to read as many as I can. You know, if I could read them all, it'd be, there are thousands. So it's impossible for each it, for to to find each one some people get mad when we don't find them or answer them and i know that because i really say i've been you know commenting forever and you never answer my things and i always say something like i'm sorry we don't answer comments you know we wouldn't read one like this and i make them <laughs> let them know that i'm actually reading them by saying no we we don't read comments anymore but i've just read it and commented or replied to it so if you have a story if you have alopecia and you have a story and or something you can enlighten us with Give us less than a paragraph. Don't do a whole novel. Get in there and give us about a paragraph and tell us what that's like and, and tell us about um, if it comes and goes or, or how that works. I have no earthly idea. I could Google it and look into it and all that, but I want to hear your experience from it. So if you have that or know somebody or live somebody that, with somebody that does, tell us about that down in the comments. I'll read them. Yeah. I, read, I read as many as I possibly can. So well, I think it's got to be tough for a woman losing her hair more than a oh, man too. I mean, it's just man. part for me, you know, having been yeah, look who's talking. through it, through it. I remember when you first start losing your hair, you're like, what? Hold on. This is not supposed to happen to me. So I can only yeah. imagine, especially for women in our culture. Mm. One of those tape replays. And so I, w- I wanted to talk to you about, you know, I think when, when it all went down on Oscars night, the, and you talk about this in the book. And so I want to leave everyone to read about it in full. But the, but the perception was that you were so offended that you'd kind of urge this action, which is bizarre in and of itself for so many reasons that you lay out in the book. But I want to hear from you, like, what were you actually hurt by about the condition that you were going through? And in that gap, between what we saw yeah. and what we didn't get to see, which everyone had their own theory on, what was actually your thought space? So where were you? Let me start with, yeah, that totally. was a really layered moment. Let me start with also that there was so much that people didn't know in regards to what was happening with Will and I at that time. And I I will leave for people to get the book. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's so much history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you go into Present, yeah. You break it down. I break it down. Hence why I did not. Exactly. There's so much history that I think would give people a lot more context to understand that moment. Let me also say that I know that was a difficult moment to watch. Because of history that Chris and I had, Um, in regards to the 2016 Oscar So White. And I'll let people read to get up to speed on that. But when I first saw Chris's name come on stage, come up as one of the presenters, I said, oh boy. I looked to Will and I was like, he's not going to be able to help himself. This is going to be something. I was like, I knew. I already knew. And I was like, okay. So Will had been going back and forth backstage all night. So when Chris said what he said, I looked to Will as if to say, see, I knew it. (laughs) Right. Um, And then I was like, oh boy, 
that's not cool to like talk about a medical condition that people, okay, there's nothing you can, like, it's, it's, it's not something that can be cured, right? And that how many stories I had heard of people, you know, young people committing suicide and the shame and just how many people suffer. And you don't even know, like once I had the condition and I saw how many people around me had, it, I was like, all these years I didn't know. And people express the shame, the level of shame they had around it. I'm going to be okay. As far as my condition, and as you can see, my hair is growing back. That's what it does. It'll grow. It'll fall out. It'll grow back again. Pieces of my eyebrows will fall out, grow back. You know, I'm having a good moment right now. My alopecia is not as extreme as most people who are dealing with that condition. And I just felt like that's not okay. So I wasn't, I wasn't upset about me. And I, I don't remember actually rolling my eyes. I think what people saw was me looking at Will going, I told you, I knew he was going to do that. And oh boy, here we go again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of- the Yeah, thing. you know, yeah. oh, here we go. But I wasn't upset about me. I really wasn't. It wasn't about me. It was just all the stories I had heard and that I continue to hear about people who have suffered from this condition. <laughs> And obviously you didn't want what happened to happen. Like, I think that uh, I'm just clarifying. Oh, yeah. I know that. I'm just clarifying it. Of course. Just it like, wasn't like I looked at Will and said, you know, you know. I know, but, and that's the kind of, you know, th those are the kind of moments of context that yeah. I, I, I lost sometimes. Listen, there was an aspect of that, that I was as shocked as anyone because Will and I hadn't been referring to each other as husband and wife since 2016. I was like, wife? Mm -hmm. oh, me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. I am. I'm okay. That's right. I am your wife. And that kicked in. I'm like, yep, here we are. In that moment that that did happen, I was like, we came together, we're leaving together. You know, that part of me that put everything else aside and was like, this is going to be something. I need to make sure Will's okay. We're going to get through this. I had no idea that that was none whatsoever. And I came as family. I actually didn't go to the Oscars as Will's wife. And I know for people that's weird, but what was going on behind the scenes, Will and I had been set, like, we weren't living as husband and wife mm -hmm. since 2016. I was happy he asked me to go. I was happy he wanted to share that moment with me still. And I was gonna be by his side. And I think also, people weren't really aware of the journey that had taken place after emancipation, as far as Will's concerned. Totally. It was a really difficult movie. And afterwards, he decided to get into therapeutic settings and he asked me to join him because mm -hmm. a lot of stuff was coming up. A lot of stuff from his past, childhood stuff. I think people didn't understand that there was a history there between he and Chris as well. So there was a lot of context that people just didn't have. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm going to tell you something else. I understand why people thought it was me. I understand why people blame me. I don't think it's right, but I understand, you know, considering the narratives that were out there that I was part of. I have to take responsibility for that. And I talk about that in the book, you know, me being the adulterous wife that had to, you know, push Will to his limit. I get it. So I couldn't even take any of it personally. And I had to put myself in the shoes of the audience and go, if I was looking at this, how it, what would I say? I probably would have said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then that made me really look at like, oh man, like culturally, we're always blaming women. Like I had to really go deep into that. Mm -hmm. Why do we do that? All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, not much on that. I mean, look, it seems that, you know, Will's, it's, it's all Will's fault, isn't it? Uh, he went and did a film, very worthy film, um, got himself into a headspace, uh, Chase, as you were indicating before, then got himself into therapeutic situations, which I'm, <laughs> I'm not, not sure whether that's therapy or, or, I don't know, hot baths or cold baths. I'm not, could be anything between actual therapy um, you know, some kind of, you know, <laughs> could be any, could be any, I mean, my mind has gone wild as to what that could possibly be. Uh, but in the end, in the end, he goes up and, uh, you know, thumps somebody mainly because apparently he got himself into these 
these situations. And, um, and then she has to put herself in the shoes of the audience, which in my experience, that was like, as an actor, that's something that you should always be doing is like, I went, how are they going to see this? Like, what's it going to be like for them? What, what would they be even before the event is happening? You're going, you're going, so what are we going to do? How are they going to see that? Are they going to see it as we intend it to be seen? So it's interesting, the language there, who's who, because of something very, very worthy has been driven into behaviors that they probably wouldn't have normally done and then driven somebody else into a behavior that they're having to put the shoes of an audience on and, and see things from their angle. Uh, very odd. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so now I'm just going to be me, be interrogator me. I'm not going to talk much about body language. For me, behavior matters only as a tool. It matters for me to be able to get to why. So I can get the person to give me whatever it is I need in terms of interrogation and that. Body language is a symptom of that behavior and a symptom of things going on in their head. So when you're looking for this stuff, all the things we're talking about, we're looking for a fracture, a weakness, something to go after. And when I see somebody who only lives in feelings, I can usually tell by language they use. When I poke and prod and we get into a discussion about government things or anything else and a person gets to, I feel, I'm done. I usually say, well, I'm not going to go into feelings because I can't feel what you feel. And I know how to manipulate feelings. And that's not fair to you. This is a situation where if this is who she is, if she's playing her her ace card, her, her hidden card or vest card, whatever you want to call it, out front, then she is a person who works mostly in feelings, mostly in that. Maybe that's because it's this specific kind of interview with Jay, and maybe he does a good job bringing it out if that's the case. But what we have seen with her today is she is very evasive with facts. Mark, we talked about it last time around this, what I call this glass pane image, that it appears I'm giving you what you need, but it's mostly in feelings. I haven't heard a lot in facts in any of these things other than the therapeutic situations. Chase, what do you got? Which isn't a fact at all. <laughs> and Scott, uh, you went last last time. Why don't you take this? Oh, one? sorry. Yeah, I'll okay. go. <laughs> all right, thanks, Chase. Um, so let me get this straight. She's made such a big deal. The last episode we did when she talked to Hoda about uh, the um, being married and staying married, but now she's forgotten that she was married. During this, she's talking about how she'd forgotten that she was married to Will Smith. She's there with him, is going to go with him. And then the whole thing where I'm sure she has to go to his house and have him picked up or however that's going to work, or they stay together that day or something, and she forgets that she's married. Going back to what you are saying, Greg, as an interrogator, this is where you'd light her up. And that's where the interviewer could have done it. It's laying right there. I mean, it's right there. And he scoot, he doesn't even bring it up. But from an interrogation perspective you'd say oh there it is i got this now but but no he doesn't do that and then she con contradicts herself again by saying uh she went as his wife that she intended to go as his wife there it is again and you could just you could just light her up with that and there's no, and at that point there's there's not much way there's not there's a slim way out of it but it's not it's it's very narrow if you're going to get out of that one and I think this is where we lose all the feeling of validity for her story or any any value in it being completely uh, true. This is where it starts to look like it's constructed for what Mark was talking about earlier, for the, the persona to be out, out in public. You know, this is what we're seeing. That's just this, that's the story she's construct, constructed for all of us to see and hear. So, which I understand, Kafka said, you know, every man must be the hero of his own story. That's paraphrased. But I get that. And that's that's what she's doing. She's protecting her ego by creating this situation where uh, she says she, she, did, she forgot she was his wife. And then she remembered, or I guess she did remember, because she said, I went as his wife. But then goes back and starting trying to protect it there. So it's 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 confusing from the point of trying to, to see this as a valid um statement or statements that she's making okay chase what do you got yeah this uh as i'm speaking right now my laptop is sat on top of a giant collect a boxed set of carl jung uh books it's called the black books set and uh what we're looking at here is a 
someone who doesn't know the shadow. So this is very common in some, and I call this an enlightenment placebo or a self-knowledge placebo, where a person is convinced that they've kind of gone to the depths. And what we're seeing here is a full video of somebody who has no blame, no flaws, and only needed healing from things that were way outside of their control. And we don't see any admission of insecurities, no anger, no resentment, no fault. There's a moment she gestures all the way to her right when she's talking about not referring to each other as husband and wife since 2016. And we associate right with future in our timelines. This might confuse some people, uh, especially if you've been a subscriber for a while. So when the video comes back on, you'll see a few references over to her right side here. So at the Oscars, this is where Will Smith was sitting beside her, and she's pointing to Will here, not referencing the timeline. So just keep that in mind. She's very referential with her gestures when she's telling the truth about stuff. And she's talking about having to go deep. I want you to really process this. She's talking about having to go deep to understand why people thought the things they did and how did they think this? How did they all think this? And then winds up at people just defaulting to blaming women. And I think she ignored the fact that she was almost a decade of false narratives deliberately being played out that she participated in and also allowed to happen in her own words, uh, saying, saying a lot of this stuff. But she had to dig deep to understand it. I don't understand how that's possible. One of those tape replays. And obviously you didn't want what happened to happen. Like, I think that oh, I'm just clarifying oh, yeah. that. I know that. I'm just clarifying it. Of course. Just it like, wasn't like I looked at Will and said, you know, you know. I know, but, and that's the kind of, you know, th those are the kind of moments of context that yeah. I, I, I lost sometimes. Listen, there was an aspect of that, that I was as shocked as anyone because Will and I hadn't been referring to each other as husband and wife since 2016. I was like, wife? Mm -hmm. oh, me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. I am. I'm okay. That's right. I am your wife. And that kicked in. I'm like, yep, here we are. In that moment that that did happen, I was like, we came together, we're leaving together. You know, that part of me that put everything else aside and was like, this is going to be something. I need to make sure Will's okay. We're going to get through this. I had no idea that that was none whatsoever. And I came as family. I actually didn't go to the Oscars as Will's wife. And I know for people that's weird, but what was going on behind the scenes, Will and I had been set, like, we weren't living as husband and wife mm -hmm. since 2016. I was happy he asked me to go. I was happy he wanted to share that moment with me still. And I was gonna be by his side. And I think also, people weren't really aware of the journey that had taken place after emancipation, as far as Will's concerned. Totally. It was a really difficult movie. And afterwards, he decided to get into therapeutic settings and he asked me to join him because mm -hmm. a lot of stuff was coming up. A lot of stuff from his past, childhood stuff. I think people didn't understand that there was a history there between he and Chris as well. So there was a lot of context that people just didn't have. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm going to tell you something else. I understand why people thought it was me. I understand why people blame me. I don't think it's right, but I understand, you know, considering the narratives that were out there that I was part of. I have to take responsibility for that. And I talk about that in the book, you know, me being the adulterous wife that had to, you know, push Will to his limit. I get it. So I couldn't even take any of it personally. And I had to put myself in the shoes of the audience and go, if I was looking at this, how it, what would I say? I probably would have said the same thing. And mm -hmm. then that made me really look at like, oh man, like culturally, we're always blaming women. Like I had to really go deep into that. Mm -hmm. Why do we do that? To Jada, one of the things that you mentioned was that you went to the Oscars as family, yeah. but not as a wife. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, how do you define the status of your relationship now? And what is it like? You know, right now, of course, we've had, it's been an intense two years. And we've really been doing some deep healing together. 
And that's why I was saying before the idea of how just really disruptive situations can amplify love in a certain manner because it kind of forces you to have to dive a little deeper. That's what we've been doing. We've just been growing together and see what happens then. See what grows from there, you know, but like I said in the book, it's like we have this beautiful friendship and we really look at our marriage as being the cornerstone of family. We're both kind of coming up with different definitions of what marriage means for us. We're still figuring all of that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the beautiful part is that there's been some really deep healing going on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that... I mean all right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm just going to start with one line. Different definitions of marriage. And I'm going to tell you that that's how you end up on this show. You have different definitions of marriage. And somebody ends up in the house fire and the other person's being analyzed by the four of us. That's how stuff happens. You can pretend all you want that you can have those two things aligned. Just be cautious how you think when you get in that situation. When he first starts talking about family, not wife, watch her. This is the first real discomfort I see in her. She shuffles. She bobbles in the chair and her feet move. And then she lip grooms. And that's probably just so that she will be more attractive in the video. Don't know. But then she changes voice tone and goes to herself and, yeah. There's contempt at an intense two years just before she moves to that deep healing. And then she talks about something about you can't walk away. You can. You, this doesn't force you to do anything. And people end up sometimes one of the people is thinking they're doing some good for the other and the other isn't. As she says, that deep healing and she's showing her hands up about deep healing. She's doing that T-Rex thing we talk about all the time. Her elbows are welded to her sides and her hands are moving. That's not openness. That's feigned openness. This doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel like I'm getting good things coming out of this. Whatever deep healing is for her may not be deep healing for the other guy. It may be something else. And she may be keenly aware of that. Not sure. Could be a lot of stuff going on. But there's a lot of uncertainty, some discomfort, and lack of transparency as she raises her hands this way. Uh, yeah. So, look, I, I think none of us are saying that you can't have a different definition of marriage than the, the one that the priest had when they married you or the one that the law office had when they. But if you want to be in a partnership, you're going to have something of the same definition. You like for three and a half years, almost four years, we've made this show. And I would suggest the reason we managed to make it week after week is we have a very similar definition of what the show is, a very similar value system. It's not the exact same value system, which means we start displaying all the same kind of behaviors. But if one of us had a whole different definition of the show and a different value system, you'd see them doing very different behaviors. And would be like, well, this isn't, going to work. So in some kind of partnership, you have to have similar definitions. So to your point, Greg, I couldn't agree more. It's okay to have a different definition of marriage, but the two people in the marriage will need to, <laughs> to have something of that different definition, which they, you know, they live by. And it, and it seems that that seems to be the problem. Now, um, what's the state of the relationship is the question. She comes up with nebulous concepts, which I think is just chaff, Greg, which is deep healing together and growing together. So it's about depth. It's about growth. The question is, is what's the status of the relationship? Like what, which for me is like, what's going on? What's going on? So I think in a, I think this is a good interview in that this person is getting her talking and and she's talking in a certain way that I think she's enjoying. And it means we've got a lot of grist for the mill here in terms of what we do, but we don't have any very defined answers for really understanding what does her daily life look like. If it were me interviewing, I might start with that question you know what's the status of the relationship but i wouldn't let deep healing together and growing together i wouldn't be nodding my head i mean i might be nodding my head and go yeah yeah exactly what's a day actually look like what happens in a day would be my question um when you have a conversation with will like what happens yeah and if she said well you know a lot of deep healing i would go yeah i, I get that 
Like, I get that. That's really good. But give me some of the words that you say. Like, how would you start talking? What might Will say in return to that? Um, and, and, and like, where, just basic stuff. Where do you see each other? Where, where did you, when did you last see each other? And where? And what did you say? And what happened? These basic fundamental things. These are not the questions that, that are getting asked. And so, you know, she is getting away with, I would say, nebulous ideas and and read the book, which is the real issue here, uh, because it, it did open at quite a high rank, uh, but has now dropped, I think, to about a 44, which is, which is it needs, buy the book, because she needs to sell that book. Like, like, you know, if you do anything today, buy the book and have a read, because she really needs you to buy that book, you know? Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, this is a perfect example, Mark, to your point of someone pretending to be public about a relationship. Pretending to be public. If you started asking me questions about my relationship, I would say, I think it's adorable that you think you're entitled to that information. (laughs) I think it's just adorable. (laughs) And then I would tell you to piss off. Uh, But when somebody's pretending to be transparent, they're they're still not revealing anything and it's still behind closed doors but they're pretending like there's an open door there and count in this video how many times does she mention will's name and let me walk you through what she mentions here and and i'll do it i think word for word i think disruptive situations can amplify love in a certain manner okay Mm -hmm. see what that what does that mean to you Here's another one. We've just been growing together. See what grows from there, you know? Like I said in the book, we have this friendship and we look at our marriage as being the cornerstone of family. We're both coming up with kind of different definitions of what marriage means. There's been some really deep healing going on. I mean, you know, That's the core of what was said here, what information was conveyed. So to analyze any behavior here would require some information, something tangible to associate the behavior with. There's only one mention of something tangible here, and it was about disruptive situations where there was some emotional downright eye accessing. And even then, there's nothing mentioned there at all. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, out of all the videos that we've seen she moves the least in this one she's leaned way back as she talks about the new ways they're defining their marriage and and what it's what it is for them and she's quiet and very still and her illustrating is at this point where you use your hands and you your it's your brain emphasizing specific words and phrases those things have dropped to zero uh, until she starts talking about will again and and she starts using words like um healing and family and growing that we'll see him there as well things that excited them we'll see him light up a little bit then they calm back down and this let this suggests to me anyway that she wants to give the impression she's got it all under control and uh, i don't think she does and then after she says and see what grows from there the smile immediately disappears right after that we've talked about this in other videos we've seen the amber heard thing where she's smiling and then it goes away that lets us know she's acting or this is put on because that's not a true emotion. Expressions, when you go from one to another one, they sort of blend into each other as you go along. They fade. Smiles fade. And fake doesn't last. Fake expressions, they go away really quick. If you're smiling and it goes away quickly, that lets you know that person, that wasn't real for whatever reason. It may not be that they're being deceptive or whatever. They just may be doing that to make you feel better or make somebody else feel better for whatever reason. And the editing here leaves so much out. Every cut has something edited out of it. So it, it watch really, really closely these shots as they change from the straight angle that they're static camera. So one angle to the next angle. Watch the changes in her um, seating position, where her arms or her hands are, where, what her face is doing. Watch those from cut to cut, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, it may, like, again, it may have been to make the the... Uh, whole thing shorter she may have just been blathering on for a long time or she may have gotten too serious about something or she may have you know talked too in depth about something that isn't very interesting maybe that's why it was cut out 
but we're I don't think we're getting the entire shot of her here. Or they may be editing it so it looks it makes her look better. I don't know. I don't think they do it so it make her look worse. One of those tape replays. So Jada, one of the things that you mentioned was that you went to the Oscars as family, yeah, but not as a wife. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, how do you define the status of your relationship now? And what is it like? You know, right now, of course, we've had, it's been an intense two years. And we've really been doing some deep healing together. And that's why I was saying before the idea of how just really disruptive situations can amplify love in a certain manner because it kind of forces you to have to dive a little deeper. That's what we've been doing. We've just been growing together and see what happens then. See what grows from there, you know? But like I said in the book, it's like we have this beautiful friendship and we really look at our marriage as being the cornerstone of family. We're both kind of coming up with different definitions of what marriage means for us. We're still figuring all of that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the beautiful part is that there's been some really deep healing going on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that... I mean You've both talked about how you feel like you're a mirror for each other. Yeah. And when I've spoken to Will as well, it's like he feels like you're the person who knows him to his core. Absolutely. And he, know, and he <laughs> yeah. knows you to your core. Like, you know everything yeah. that potentially there is to know about each other. Everything. And you're obviously still learning. Yeah. What's really interesting about that is some people would say, well, why not just get divorced? Yeah. Everybody's always like, yeah. why don't you just get divorced? Yeah. And it's like, mm, that's like quitting I don't think there's any person that could embrace the best and the worst of me and be able, be willing to hold space in the way that Will holds space for me and the way that I hold space for him. And I know that most people probably go into their relationship as like, you are here to please me. And yeah, our relationship isn't quite that. <laughs> Like, it's more about there's no greater mirror I could have than Will. He doesn't, I can't, I can't get around myself just like he can't get around himself with me. And I think that that's just been what this has been all about. Like, it's been a deep clearing, like really having to look at yourself in ways in that mirror that, sure, we talk about this all the time. Would it be easier to go and find somebody else and have a more pleasing, more comfortable relationship? Maybe. But would that get me to the person that I really want to be? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And I'm not saying that everybody's relationship is supposed to be that. I'm not here to say that. I'm just saying that that's what my relationship is. Mm -hmm. That's something I desire to get to a, a deeper part a more spiritually sound, emotionally sound, and really understand love unconditionally. And the thing that I've learned about unconditional love, you can't really understand what unconditional love in ideal circumstances <laughs> mm. to really get to what it is to love yourself and someone else completely with all that's divine, all that's human, all that's perfect, and all that is deeply flawed and have full acceptance for it all. I tell you, this is, <laughs> you know, marriage is not for the faint at heart. Mm. It's just not. Mm. And it is definitely, I believe, I believe you know, different people get married for different reasons. So I'm not trying to say why anybody else should be married. But for me, the holy path of getting to a divine aspect of myself mm. in partnership with Will. And it seems like Will wants the same for himself. 
and it's taken us, you know, I mean, we got together at what? I was 23. Okay. 23 when I first decided to commit myself Mm -hmm. to Willard Carroll Smith. Lord Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) So young. So young. We were babies, babies trying to figure this out. And you know what's interesting about young relationships? You create these young patterns that get so like these really young, immature patterns Mm -hmm. in yourself and how you relate to your partner. And then you create these dynamics between one another that it takes a while Mm -hmm. to like really be willing to look at that stuff and dissolve it and let it go and mature and grow. Mm -hmm. It takes some real like self-inventory, patience, courage, right? Because you're breaking down everything, Mm -hmm. all your romantic ideas, everything you thought, you know, relationship or marriage, all your romantic fantasies, (laughs) (laughs) you know, just, you know, blow up in flames. But it's really been freeing. Mm -hmm. It's really been freeing to see what's more true, Mm -hmm. right? I'm not saying that I know the truth yet. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I'm seeing more of what's true, Mm -hmm. you know, as regards to what love and partnership is about. Mm. Because I was definitely one of those people that's like, you're here to make me happy. And when you don't do it, that's a problem. All right, Greg, what do you got? I'm just going to hit a few things. Everybody says get a divorce. I thought nobody knew you were living apart. Nobody. Nobody. It's just us, clearly. That's number one. Maybe there are other people, and she's just using that word broadly. This is another 180 to her story, though, because she acts like they're together. I mean, she's nobody knows. I'm still learning. We're doing this. That's weird to me that she's suddenly done a 180 like they're living together and that they're every day working on this thing or that thing. I, candidly, I think she's more about feelings than she is about facts. And I think that's what we're seeing. She feels like this. She feels like they're connected. And that makes it a tough discussion when you're talking to somebody who does that. She also adds the word clearing, clearing. This is clearing. That's very specific language to a very specific religion. So here's yet another decorator crab of religion or a low country boil of religion. We're getting together. Nothing. Not there's anything wrong with creating your own religion. Clearly, people have made a ton of money doing it in the past. But that's what it is, and it's pulling together. She talks about I desire. She doesn't talk about will one time. She says, I desire in this situation. Well, if I have a very different opinion than you do about what marriage is, and I want to keep you in it because it's going to make me clear and better, that doesn't sound like a very healthy relationship from my angle. Everybody has to figure out their own relationship and how all that works. All I would say is in the approach of saying these words, you have to be careful that you're not perceived as being some kind of a monster. And I think people tore her to pieces in our last chat, in our last live, um, our, our live debut or our live premiere. People were tearing her to pieces because they have this perception of her as some kind of a monster. So you have to be really careful when you're using language this way that I desire he has a different opinion and we can't separate and, and, and. We're back to Scott, something you just said. You're kind of a marriage hostage, not necessarily a partner. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, um, I, th- I think it's helpful to have something of a mirror out there, though it's it's confusing as to what a mirror to yourself would ever be, because of course, you know, y- you are it. I mean, you're you're perceiving, you're doing the final perception. So everything, everything out there is basically a, a mirror of you. Um, and and I would be concerned, especially within uh, Hollywood um, or any entertainment world, that the mirror is not a fairground mirror, a very distorted mirror. Uh, so, so there's a there's a bit of an irony there about the the this external world. She looks to this external world as the as the most important reflection of of her. Uh, divorce is quitting, she says. I think that again speaks chase to your sunk cost fallacy idea. Divorce is quitting. Well, is it more like in fact that she won't change? mirrors because some people would say 
yeah, you know, you've probably had it with that mirror. Change the mirror. Yeah, but, I, you know, this mirror knows me best. It's rather like with a therapist when you won't change therapists. It's like, but we've done all this work and they know so much about me. And, like, I've done, it's like, no, it's not working. Like, go find another one and start again. I know it's hard, but start again. It isn't isn't working uh, for you. Uh, exactly the same, Greg. Deep clearing, in fact, deep clearing has, has is is going on there. Um, look, it seems to me from what she's saying, and I haven't really talked much about body language throughout this um, because it's very interesting what she says. It seems to me that will for her is a tool for the holy path of finding the divine aspect of herself. He's he's one of the things she's having to use or she's going to use in order to come out of this, this journey that she's on of finding the divine in her. Uh, look, no, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I just, my opinion is I wouldn't want to be Will in that situation, unless I'd really signed up for this at the start and gone, I will do that for you. I will be the fairground mirror that will that will show you the reflection of you walking along this path to your divine self. I, I hope for her she gets that design, divine self that she's looking for. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll buy the book when that one comes out, maybe, because uh, that, that could be interesting. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This is like if you ask chat GPT to come up with generic words to randomly talk about marriage. That's kind of what this video is. There's no reference to her flaws, only Will's. And there's all these rumors about her being controlling, about Will being controlled and subordinated, about her being almost domineering over him. Where is the denial? Where is one sentence that really denies this or gives Will some agency, some credit, some respect to him? except saying he's human, which is kind of the only message we got about Will here throughout these videos. That's all I got. Scott? All right, here's where it gets a little bit strange for me. She lives a life of a divorced person. However, she doesn't want to get divorced. So I, found, I thought that was interesting. And after she says, he holds a space for me and I hold a space for him, she says, and, and there's a huge uh, expression of contempt. And I think that expression is for the next, the following sentence where she talks about uh, the people who think differently than she does about a relationship and marriage. And then she laughs about that, like her version of marriage is the one and can't believe how everybody else doesn't see that, which makes sense because she's been reading all these books. And it makes a lot of sense to her what she's thinking or what she's figured out at this point. And then when she goes on to describe, sounds like she's holding, almost like she's holding him hostage by staying married. Like she doesn't want to do anything that things that come with marriage. She doesn't want to hang out with him every night. She doesn't want to eat with him every night. She doesn't want to watch um, videos with him every night. She doesn't want to do any of this stuff. She wants to live in her own place. She wants to live, live in his place, but she still wants that connection of marriage. It sounds like she's almost holding him hostage as being married. Whatever situation they have going on, sounds like it's really odd. Um, and maybe it's some some religious thing they haven't we haven't found out about yet or she hasn't told the world about yet that won't let him get divorced. Maybe it's something like that, but it sounds like she's holding on to him and he can't get away. Almost like a hostage situation. One of those tape replays. You've both talked about how you feel like you're a mirror for each other. Yeah. And when I've spoken to Will as well, it's like, he feels like you're the person who knows him to his core. Absolutely. And he, know, and he <laughs> yeah. knows you to your core. Like, you know, everything yeah. There, potentially there is to know about each other. Everything. And you're obviously still learning. Yeah. What's really interesting about that is some people would say, well, why not just get divorced? Yeah. Everybody's always like, yeah. why don't you just get divorced? Yeah. And it's like, mm, that's like quitting. I don't think there's any person that could embrace the best and the worst of me and be able, be willing to hold space in the way that Will holds space for me, in the way that I hold space for him. And I know that most people probably go into their relationship as like, you are here to please me. And 
yeah, our relationship isn't quite that. (laughs) You know, it's like, it's more about, there's no greater mirror I could have than Will. He doesn't, I can't, I can't get around myself just like he can't get around himself with me. And I think that that's just been what this has been all about. Like it's been a deep clearing, like really having to look at yourself in ways in that mirror that sure, we talk about this all the time. Would it be easier to go and find somebody else and have a more pleasing, more comfortable relationship? Maybe, but would that get me to the person that I really want to be. Mm. I don't think so. And I'm not saying that everybody's relationship is supposed to be that. I'm not here to say that. I'm just saying that that's what my relationship is. Mm. That's something I desire to get to a, a deeper part, a more spiritually sound, emotionally sound, and really understand love unconditionally. And the thing that I've learned about unconditional love, you can't really understand what unconditional love in ideal circumstances <laughs> mm. to really get to what it is to love yourself and someone else completely mm. with all that's divine, all that's human, all that's perfect, and all that is deeply flawed and have full acceptance for it all. I tell you, this is, <laughs> you know, marriage is not for the faint at heart. Mm. It's just not. Mm. And it is definitely, I believe, I believe, you know, different people get married for different reasons. So I'm not trying to say why anybody else should be married. But for me, the holy path of getting to a divine aspect of myself Mm. in partnership with Will. And it seems like Will wants the same for himself. Mm. And it's taken us, you know, I mean, we got together at what? I was 23, okay? 23 when I first decided to commit myself Mm. to Willard Carroll Smith, Lord Jesus. So young. So young. We were babies, babies trying to figure this out. And you know what's interesting about young relationships? You create these young patterns that get so, like these really young, immature patterns Mm -hmm. in yourself and how you relate to your partner. And then you create these dynamics between one another that it takes a while Mm. To like really be willing to look at that stuff and dissolve it and let it go and mature and grow. Mm. It takes some real like self-inventory, patience, courage, Mm. right? Because you're breaking down everything, Mm. all your romantic ideas, everything you thought you know, relationship or marriage, all your romantic fantasies, (laughs) you know, just, you know, blow up in flames. But it's really been freeing. It's really been freeing to see what's more true, right? I'm not saying that I know the truth yet. I just feel like I'm seeing more of what's true, you know, as regards to, what love and partnership is about. Mm. Because I was definitely one of those people that's like, you're here to make me happy. And when you don't do it, that's a problem. Just one more thing. All right, Mark, what have you seen so far up to this point? No, I'm I'm maybe a little old fashioned. When I hear an interview with somebody, I usually like, you know, a few facts. I like to hear some feelings. Um, And I like to hear a bit of conceptual stuff as well. I'm, I, you know, I like the full, the full meal, the full dinner. Uh, I hear a lot of conceptual stuff here. Um, I hear, a, you know, a little bit of feelings, but they tend to get chunked up more for me in, in concepts. And I hear very little factual detail, if, if any, really. And so the more I listen to uh, Jada, the, the more, um, confused I I get 
Um, and I don't think that's because of my intelligence level or not really being able to, you know, understand the layers or even that I haven't read the book. Um, though it, it, some of this does really convince me that I should go out and buy the book so that I really can understand every potential, you know, context for this and understand it so much better, you know, what is going on here. Uh, but I get left, I would say, a little bit hollow uh, by it. And maybe there's an irony in that, that I get left hollow. Chase, what do you got? I can already hear, like, some people are going to say, like, well, they did this for their kids. And why didn't you talk about them doing this for their kids? You know why we didn't talk about that? Because they didn't say it. And this is artificial transparency. This shows a consistent use of vague and evasive language, suggesting that there's a whole book you can go by. But there's also an effort on her part to appear profound while I think avoiding anything of real substance. And we're seeing just repeated needs for validation with this right and all of this stuff, which I think might go to her personal psychology. And I think Jada positions herself as a passive recipient of external events, avoiding a lot of responsibility. And when it comes to the mention of healing, what needs to heal? Wounds need to heal. And the way she refers to healing as being in progress would suggest that none of the wounds have healed yet. Some people talk about their wounds, which should have turned into scars a long time ago. So be careful around those people, especially old fashioned kind of people like Mark, who just want to hear facts and real things in a conversation. That's weird. Greg? Mark, take one for the team, read the book, tell me what's in it. Not interested. <laughs> yeah. You got I've it. Had enough. Two, like I said, two and a half hours of this, I might go slap Chris Rock for Will Smith. I just, ugh, it was just too much for me. A lot of feelings, a lot of, and, and you said it probably better, a lot of ideas, concepts about feelings, not real feelings. Hey, I felt this way. He did this. He did that. My guess is deep buried in all of this, if we were to get their therapist to talk, is they have some egregious problem between them way back when that caused all this abrupt changes. But that coming together and going, we all know that the more cloistered you are, the more likely your ideas are to become strange. Every one of you, there was a pandemic. You're living at home, having very little interaction with people other than two or three. Think about what that did to your psyche in that short period of time. Now, plug yourself into an environment where you are sequestered because of the nature of their life. And if you don't take some kind of input, then you start getting very navel-gazing kind of mindset ideas. And when you come out and tell them to the public, they'll seem really outlandish and really off. So you have to be very careful how you approach this. And doing this therapy talk with a person where we can all listen to her might reinforce the beliefs that other people had. And it might not be true. It might be that Will Smith did something horrific and she's angry and she's holding vengeful thought to him. It might be that she's trying to make the best of things. We will never know that. We can only say what we see. Scott, what do you got? I'm with Mark. The Sesquipedalian prose of Jada Pinkett Smith has left me hollow. I don't <laughs> have that stuff. Just there's nothing there. There's a fellow named Stephen Bishop. And one time he said, I feel so miserable without you. It's almost like you're here. And I would surmise, I would believe that's probably the way Will thinks when he sees things like this or, or when he when he hears what's happened. Gosh, this is so negative. But I don't but think I, she's probably not a horrible person. I don't, I don't think, think she is. Person. But I think, I don't think she fake. is. Chase, I think yeah. I think if if she were not saying all this this stuff. <laughs> You probably would like her in the conversation. She's probably yeah. a nice woman. You enjoy yeah. talking to her. And she's not doing herself any favors is the problem. The more you spill your psyche and you play that card, I mean, you hit it early on, you, that should be a role. Should yeah. be a role. Sorry, Scott, yeah. I interrupted you. No, it's totally cool. No, I was, I was finished anyway. But I did hear, like, a from oh, a person who dealt with her said she was the sweetest person in the world and so nice and so wants to. He couldn't go on enough about her. So he said she was really wonderful. So I'm more apt to believe the guy and think she's probably wonderful. And this is probably just something she's doing as her persona to, uh, and, and that's you know, possible, sure, protect herself or to be the person she wants everybody to see. So, all right, fellas, thanks for another good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?